<laughs> so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of our event, the European Alliance for Apprenticeships on Track. We had a very intense day yesterday, full of activities, very interesting. Uh, so I'm very happy to see you again here, fresh and ready for in-depth discussion uh, in our second day. Uh, I would like to reiterate our thanks to IBB uh, for the great organization and uh, all the possibilities that they gave us yesterday. Uh, you just recognize our visit in the training center in, in the video we just watched. I think it was a great opportunity to connect with the real world of apprentices. It was uh, very refreshing and inspiring to see their motivation, their positivism, and also the very good prospects they have in the labor market. I, I was particularly very impressed to see all these young women and uh, uh, men uh, working very hard to become uh, professionals, uh, very probably also in the, in the rail sector. We also had the opportunity to reconnect in the lunch and the dinner uh, that they uh, offered us. Uh, it was a very nice occasion and uh, very good to talk to practitioners, apprentices and policymakers to, to reflect uh, about uh, the challenges and the opportunities or, of our fields of expertise. So thanks again for, for that possibility. I think that the way it has been a bit long, this event has been delayed, we've already discussed about that, but uh, due to COVID and uh, we've been uh, following the situation the last couple of months to see when it was possible to organize this event. And uh, people here in UBB and also in DigiMove uh, were also uh, very actively involved in, in this objective. Particularly, I would like to remind about our colleague Norbert Schobel uh, from my unit in, in the commission who recently retired. And uh, he was part of the conception of this whole uh, event Event, and we are grateful uh, for his drive and uh, his very fresh ideas. So, unfortunately, he's not here with us today because he already retired, but we thank him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I would also like to thank Digimove for their uh, cooperation, very good cooperation, because this event is under the frame of the European Year of Rail, even if it was last year, and they've been also instrumental in helping us identify new partners that uh, have recently joined uh, the Alliance for Apprenticeships. We have new, uh, nine new partners uh, related to the uh, rail sector uh, that will be uh, presented later on by one of my uh, colleagues. So, um, now, about the agenda today, uh, I'm pretty sure that you've had the opportunity to go through it. We have uh, in-depth discussions on three uh, particular topics, the digital and the green transitions, the gender equality, and also the mobility and transnational cooperation uh, in the field of apprenticeships and with a particular focus on the rail sector, of course. So uh, thanks again to all the speakers uh, representing a wide variety of stakeholders uh, in the field that will be joining us today and that have carefully prepared their contributions uh, that will be a key for uh, the discussions. Uh, we will also have the opportunity to discuss in small groups uh, later this afternoon, and uh, this will be very helpful to further reflect on the challenges and also so you share your insights and best practices that we always keep in mind for policymaking developments um, in the area. Uh, just uh, another welcome to our online participants. As you know, this is being uh, recorded and we also have online participants, many other EAFA uh, members that could not be here with us today. So I encourage them to uh, share their comments and their questions uh, in the right channels. They are following through e our account in EU social uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and we will be raising these questions in the question and answer slot uh, in, in every session. 
So uh, now, without uh, further delay, uh, we will uh, welcome our keynote speakers. Uh, the first one will be uh, Commissioner Nicola Schmidt. Unfortunately, he could not be here with us today, but we will show you a video with a message from him. Dear friends, dear apprentices, I am delighted to welcome you to the event European Alliance for Apprenticeships on Track. Last year was the European Year of Rail. Rightly so, because the railway sector is a major piece in the big puzzle of Europe's climate neutrality aims under the Green Deal. This year is the European Year of Youth, a year for young people in Europe to engage and be heard. Apprenticeships bring both together. Apprenticeships can provide a first-class entry for young people into the railway sector, which is in urgent need of new staff because a large share of the workforce will retire in the next 10 years. By boosting apprenticeships, the rail industry will attract young people with the right skills and who will become fully qualified. It will also provide an opportunity to address gender stereotypes connected with some of the occupations in the sector. This, in turn, will also help tackle youth unemployment, which unfortunately remains double the general unemployment rate in the EU. The Commission is actively promoting apprenticeships among companies and young people. The renewed European Alliance for Apprenticeships brings together governments, social partners, businesses, chambers, regions, youth organizations, vocational education and training providers and think tanks. It has been instrumental in mobilizing over one million apprenticeship opportunities since its set up in 2013. I am very pleased that 11 stakeholders in the railway sector across Europe have already made concrete commitments to strengthen the supply, the quality, the attractiveness and the mobility in their apprenticeships. The recently relaunched European Apprentice Network encourages apprentices to get organized and have their voice heard in policy making. Significant EU funding is available to support youth employment and the education and training systems, including apprenticeships. To promote apprenticeships, we need everybody on board. National authorities, companies, individuals, including young people, social partners and other stakeholders. Working together, sharing knowledge and experience, as you also are doing here today, is the key to unlocking the vast potential of apprenticeships and to empower young people to fully participate in the labor market and society. I wish you fruitful exchanges. So, after this nice message from the Commissioner for uh, Jobs and Social Rights, I give the floor to Silvia Angelo, member of the board of UBB Infrastructure. Thanks a lot for the good cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I also wish you a nice uh, morning. On behalf of the UBB, I'm glad to have sent you a very warm welcome. I think, um, as the Commissioner already said, um, last year it was the year of European Rail. This year is the year of youth and um, unfortunately, of course, we couldn't have this conference the last year, but I think there's also a positive impact because this conference is something like a bridge between these two years 
And the ÖBB infrastructure is very good in building bridges. That's some of our core business. So I'm quite sure that my colleagues are also going to have a, prepare you a very good conference with this symbolic bridge, I would say. I'm really very pleased, and not only pleased, but also honored to have this high-level conference here in Vienna. We are, of course, very proud, and I think you noticed it yesterday, we are very proud of our training centers, of all we can do for the apprentices. So um, we are happy to, to have you here physically to show it to you. And um, as far as I already learned, uh, you had a very fruitful discussion and uh, a field experience yesterday. I would like to thank, of course, all our partners, the European Commission, uh, DG Employment, DG Move. I would thank, first of all, also the European Alliance for Apprenticeship and, of course, the Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology and for all the cooperation we had and, of course, for the preparation. And I would um, also say a great uh, thank you uh, to Stefan Baufeld. He was very much engaged in um, preparing the conference and I think he did a great job. You will see it also uh, in the rest of the day, of course. So you saw it already on the agenda. I think this conference is uh, tackling with a lot of important issues we have here in our times. It's first of all digitalization, of course, gender equality, which is also for me, it's a main issue. And last but not least, uh, the subject of climate change, which is one of our most, I would say, of our greatest challenges we face these days. Climate crisis and climate change requires all of our efforts. And I think um, it's very good that the European Commission had set a very ambitious goal for reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, we should, I think, be very uh, consequent in going this way because it's, of course, our future and the future of our kids and, and, and grandchildren. The ÖBB is one of the largest climate protection companies in Austria and we see ourselves as a reliable partner for a sustainable mobility transition. But to make this transition really reality, we need a lot of good people, of helpful hands, and that's also this symbolic bridge, I think, which is very important, that the, really the people we need, we are in the great, in, or in the, in the most of them, we are going to, to learn to apprentice ourselves. And that's perhaps also a difference from, from other companies. So we need well-trained employees, and we really are um, really dependent on what they are bringing with them and what they are, that they stay with us in the future, which is also a big issue, I think, in these days. We have taken some new path also in recruiting. We have added new so-called green jobs in our apprenticeships. And as you have seen already yesterday, we are focusing very much on digitalization and digitalization training. So we have seen also, I think, our future lab uh, labor. And uh, we are also focusing very much on diversity. I think that's also a big issue. I guess you will learn a lot on all these issues. I've seen the agenda. Um, and I'm very, very happy once again to say that you can stay really in reality with us, some of us virtually uh, through, the, through the channel. We have a lot of, of um, issues to tackle. I think we have a war now in, in Europe, which is very much considering us all. So it's important now more than ever that we stay together in Europe, but of course, uh, not only in Europe, all on the, on the world, and that we have um, to develop our values and what we, our knowledges to build up, I think, a safe and a really good future for us and for all of us. Thank you very much and good conference. Thanks a lot, Silvia. 
Now uh, we will start with a panel of uh, three representatives. Uh, Manuela Geleng uh, from the European Commission, Director for Jobs and Skills. Christian Schmidt, uh, Director for Mobility and Transport at the European Commission. And also Sarah bidner krausak Head of Mobility and Transport at the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action. So please join me here at the stage. They will help us set the scene for the session today. So, Manuela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, and uh, good morning to you all. I'm uh, really delighted to uh, be here to talk about apprentices in the, in the rail sector and uh, to see actually the interest uh, the topic has raised. First of all, I would like to thank the Austrian authorities and um, more specifically ÖBB for the hospitality and the excellent organization. And let me say, it's always a pleasure to say hi to Vienna, a, a city in which I spent really my best university years. So, uh, coming back to the topic that occupies us today, we are going to have, hold discussions on several topics related to apprenticeships, namely the challenges to the digital and green transitions, the issue of attractiveness of vocational education and training and apprenticeships, with a specific focus on the rail sector, of course, and gender balance, and mobility and transnational cooperation. As Commissioner said, just uh, said, the railway sector will be key to make the transport in the EU more sustainable and to help us reach climate neutrality by 2050, in line with the EU Green Deal. The industry is already changing, driven by the need to adopt new technology that enables the delivery of more efficient, faster and sustainable solutions for passengers and goods. Innovation and digitalization are key to the further development of the rail sector, and the scale of technological and digital changes ahead will make the industry and an exciting and dynamic place to work. Like all sectors, the rail sector is facing the challenges of digitalization. And I think uh, my, the, the speaker before me, Silvia D'Angelo, she already highlighted uh, that. And indeed, here we need a game changer. Uh, we need to upskill in digital skills. Uh, yet, and, and why this? Because if we look at European citizens, um, 35 of European uh, percent, 35 percent of European workers currently have insufficient digital skills. And if we look at European citizens in general, this is 43 percent. And of course, if we are not able to tackle this uh, digital divide, this will lead to growing inequalities. So we need to ensure that the vocational education and apprenticeship sectors help us closing the digital divide. These changes uh, will also uh, require a highly skilled workforce. And I do think that vocational education and training and apprenticeships offer really real opportunities in terms of skills development. And apprenticeships are also an essential learning pathways for young people. They are really a good way to facilitate the school to work transitions. That is why the objective of this conference is to promote the attractiveness of apprenticeships in the railway sector for young people, as well as to encourage all stakeholders in the rail industry to raise awareness to reach out to the new target groups, and especially young women. And now I would like to focus a little bit on the attractiveness of vocational education and training and, uh, and achieving gender, gender balance. Because whatever sector uh, we see, when it comes to the more technical uh, sectors uh, where uh, normally men are uh, involved, we see less and less uh, women, women there. Uh, and this is, 
this case of the rail sector. Gender has been obviously on the Commission agenda since uh, a long time, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, because we see that uh, the share of women workers in the industry is just over 21%. Social dialogue is here uh, an important player to help us reach these equality goals. The railway sectoral social dialogue supports making the profession more attractive, including for young people and for women. And in uh, uh, the context of this social dialogue, a very important legal bi legally binding agreement uh, was reached on women in rail last November. And this agreement is really important because it aims at attracting more women to the railway sector by creating an appealing work environment and by offering equal opportunities for both women and men at all areas and and at all levels. This challenge requires new commitment, obviously, as recently demonstrated by the Austrian companies in the railway sector that have introduced a quota of up to 45% female workers to be met across all job fields and a 5% quota of women when filling uh, management position. I think we can only applaud to this initiative. Now, my third topic uh, is mobility. Mobility as a way to boost apprentices, uh, to gain their independence, to learn new skills, to learn new, new languages through international work experience. The companies involved, I would say, would also benefit from uh, mobility schemes as cultural exchanges foster creativity reinforce the company's skills base and attract international talent. This is particularly important in the rail sector. Efficient, safe and secure operation of rail services requires the availability of rail staff who can work seamlessly across borders and across operational and language barriers. At EU level, uh, we have set ambitious targets in terms of mobility of vocational education and training learners including apprentices, we would like to achieve 8% of uh, mobility of vocational education and training learners by, um, by 2025. So, to facilitate this, um, we have Erasmus+. Plus. Here the funding has been substantially uh, scaled up and we, in, we probably will be reaching 2 million vocational education and training students and staff um, that will have had a EU-funded mobility uh, within uh, uh, 2027. Of course, the mobility of apprenticeship says requires cooperation among all the, the players, and uh, here the lack of harmonization of VAT profiles in the transnational rate and freight traffic is a factor often mentioned as an obstacle for the mobility of apprentices. Cooperation is also uh, very important for skills in general. And in fact, by being a member of uh, the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, you are also a member of a bigger family, the family of the Pact for Skills. And the Pact for Skills is also all about cooperation. Uh, it is about joining forces between the public and the private sector, uh, social partners and other stakeholders with a view to help address the industry skills uh, challenges. So the idea of the Pact for Skills is namely to mobilize stakeholders throughout the industrial ecosystems to invest in up- and reskilling actions. And within the Pact, the mobility ecosystems includes production of trains and the construction of ecosystems and the building of railways. So, uh, in my last words, I would also like to appeal you that besides your pledges that are absolutely crucial in the Alliance, uh, to the Alliance for Apprenticeships, you also join the Pact for Skills with concrete commitments of, for up and reskilling in light of the huge challenges we have before us, both 
uh, in, as regards digital and, and green. And surely we will accomplish that, and we will accomplish that if we will work all uh, together, like we are doing here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuela. Thanks for your inspiring words. Uh, now, Christian, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and uh, greeting to my fellow panelists, Manuela and uh, Sarah and uh, Silvia. Um, it's a pleasure to be back uh, in Vienna. I was last year uh, during the European Year Rail, um, coming from Rome through the Brenner here to Austria in September. And I must say, UBB treated us like royalty when the European train came to town. It was a big party. Um, so this, in many ways, is the after party, I guess, something that young people will understand is often the best part of the party. Um, so here we are at the European Year of Rail after party. Um, let me also thank, of course, all the uh, um, partners who are involved in organizing this. Uh, the European Year of Rail was a great success, but we focused very much on legislation, regulation, on interoperability issues. We focused too little on people. Um, and it was something um, I felt a little bit bad about uh, during the year because it is people uh, that are uh, on the trains that are driving the locomotives, and therefore I made it a priority to come for this event, uh, even if it was uh, also in the middle of um, another priority after the pandemic, uh, and that is the war in Ukraine, um, something that personally takes uh, half my time right now. I want to take the opportunity also to pay tribute to the ÖBB. Um, after this meeting, I will go and see your boss, um, Andreas Matej, and I last saw him on the Polish-Ukrainian border in March, um, where UBB was uh, transporting free of charge Ukrainian refugees to safety. Seven million so far, six million uh, in Poland. Um, and now we are focusing on exporting grains, feeding Europe and the world, and keeping the Ukrainian economy going. So UBB certainly um, is doing its duty as a European company, and I want to put that on, on record. So, yeah, pandemic, war in Ukraine, but we haven't forgotten the European Green Deal at the European Commission. Um, and certainly you are aware that uh, 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 we are aiming for um, a climate-neutral continent in Europe. Transport is the one sector where CO2 emissions are not yet falling, and therefore uh, it is a priority uh, to, to decarbonize transport. Uh, we call for a 90% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And, of course, you all know rail is one of the cleanest modes of transport that we have. It accounts for only 0.4% of transport-related uh, uh, emissions. So it is the, the, the cleanest, but is it also the cheapest? Um, I'm not sure we would all agree that it is. I certainly think it should be cheaper. Uh, coming here with uh, an UBB night jet, uh, 128 euros for a one-way ticket. I confess I'm flying back, <laughs> uh, and it is more expensive to fly back. Um, it's 162 euros back to Brussels uh, tonight, Vienna, uh, Brussels. But that's because uh, me and my colleagues, we went in the cheapest uh, sleeping couchette uh, of the night jet. If I'd taken the normal business class or the, the real sleeping, then the, the plane would have been cheaper. So, um, and plus we waited 30 minutes uh, in Aachen while we are changing locomotives. I'll raise that with uh, Andreas uh, when I see him. Uh, it takes too long. So uh, we have uh, work to do to improve our railways. Um, and of course, people play um, a, a part uh, in, in that. And when we look to the future, um, clearly the future is bright for, for rail. There's a, there's a momentum uh, here. But at the same time, we have challenges. We are going to face, as was mentioned, uh, a, a serious shortage of uh, of staff over the coming years, um, where a large sector uh, share of the workforce is expected to retire. I understood in Austria, 40,000 people. Um, a third of them will retire uh, in the next couple of years. Um, uh, for Europe as a whole, in 2018, we had 42% of the staff working in railway undertakings older than 50. You can include me in that figure if you want to, um, although I'm not. Uh, I think in that category of age I am, huh? but not of uh, working in railways. Uh, that's 2% more than in 2015. It's 
So, um, and infrastructure managers uh, generally are older than in the railway undertakings. So certainly there's a, there's a challenge here on the, on the, on the shortage of, uh, of staff, but also on skills. Um, those who know railways are aware that um, we are in the middle, in the middle of a, 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 a digital revolution um, in all areas in rail, whether it's automatic driving, um, signal systems, um, path allocation, all the uh, areas that uh, for centuries have been done manually uh, are going digital. And of course, that calls also for a revolution in the skills uh, that um, railway uh, staff has. And I must say, um, I often feel that this is going to be a huge challenge. I see before me old men needing to learn new skills. Uh, and that's not always easy. So it gave me great hope to visit your training set, uh, center yesterday. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, 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 UBB de Luxe, uh, what we saw, um, a, a light and modern building um, with uh, uh, a room for 700 students uh, coming and going between uh, job and training, uh, 13 different specializations. Very, very, very impressive. It, it, it is a, and 20% women, it is a place where you would want to bring your daughter um, to work uh, and to, to be educated. Uh, and indeed, there were quite a few of them. By the way, how nice to be in a panel that is not only male. Uh, that happens to me very rarely when I am dealing with rail. So here, um, it is a, a very nice, nice change. But I mean, we saw people building circuit boards, building 3D printers that could build components to build more 3D printers, uh, so <laughs> multiplying. Um, hundreds of, uh, of, of young people, diversity, dressed like Super Marios, uh, or Super Marias, because uh, many, many women also. Um, you told me 80,000 euros per student um, for that course, 80,000 euros. Um, not paid by the student, um, and including boarding. Uh, not surprisingly, 85% of those stay uh, with ÖBB, uh, and almost with certainty of getting a job um, and, and skills that can be uh, used elsewhere otherwise. So they uh, join and never leave. Um, sounds a bit like the European Commission. Uh, so certainly, Good uh, conditions, very selective entry, like the European Commission. Uh, so difficult to get in and get at a post. But this give me, gives me hope that um, we will be able to attract young people uh, to the railway sector. Uh, if these are the conditions and these are the perspectives for job opportunities, then there is, uh, there is hope. We um, met with uh, a few impressive young women also. Uh, Ronya, 19 year old, uh, doing high school diplomas in parallel and wanted to be an electrical engineer. Go girl, I mean, and uh, Cindy, 17, IT, also going for university. Uh, these are the managers of the future, um, and um, it's 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 really nice. To, it's really nice to see. I think uh, Ferre, uh, we were sharing a cabin here, coming from Brussels. You could only dream of things like this in an Ostende in uh, in Belgium. No, uh, impressive uh, conditions. Very jealous, eh? Also, uh, and here I come to a more serious point, um, many of the students we met spoke excellent English. Uh, yet, um, what they were trained to do was, of course, specific to the Austrian situation, to the situation of ÖBB, perhaps with skills that can be transferred across borders, but in German software developed by ÖBB um, on systems specific to ÖBB. Of course, it is our job at the Commission to harmonize national rules, to harmonize across Europe all the technical systems that uh, railways are working on, so that also you can harmonize the training. But I have a very, I have a very specific uh, appeal to all those representing training institutions um, across Europe, um, and that is to work together, um, to learn from each other. I'm sure those from other member states, Belgium, SNCB, uh, SNCF, Deutsche Bahn, who've been here, have been impressed like I was yesterday. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we did not all duplicate um, all these things, saved costs, work together, and educated people who could, if they started in ÖBB but fell in love with a Belgian 
handsome young man um, and wanted to move to Brussels or elsewhere could transfer those skills and work elsewhere. Uh, this is what you have in all the other transport modes. This is what you don't have in rail. And it is an impediment for fighting the shortage of skills. And it is an impediment for trains crossing borders and train drivers not having to get off the train and then uh, wait for a French-speaking colleague uh, to take over and, and go the rest of the way. So um, this alliance um, that, is, that is being launched here, it's really a great response from the sector to see everybody joining in. Um, but it should be more than just uh, a collection of national commitments. It should be um, the future of a sharing of uh, expertise, of training centers. And why not exchanges? Why not have people like Ferre coming from Belgium and stay a while in Vienna uh, at the center and then going back and learning? This is how we could um, further integrate um, the, um, the future. Certainly the Commission would be more than happy uh, to support that kind of exchange. We have Erasmus Montus, we have vocational training. Um, this kind of vocational training that we saw yesterday, I'm sure would be attractive. Uh, if you had a look, uh, you would see this is a place where, as a young person, you want to go, uh, and you can see your future is secured once you are, you are there. So vocational training doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be bad. Thank you for showing us this. So um, I want to finish with a, a message of, uh, uh, of optimism to the, to the railway sector and everybody in this room. Um, it is a huge priority at the European Commission, but not only. Uh, member states, as part of the um, recurrent resilience plans, the pan post-pandemic economic recovery package, are investing billions, billions of euros <clears throat> into new infrastructure, into uh, railways. Um, and of course, you see that the public across Europe um, are returning to trains. Uh, our environmental conscience, um, not only, but we also have to make it better and more affordable, and we're working on, on that. But there is a bright future for rail in Europe, but not if we are complacent about uh, uh, the efficiency and the appeal that it has um, as a market offer. But there are to be created, and it's already happening, speaking with the rail supply industry, um, thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs um, that are being created in the railway sector. And so to the young people who have chosen this sector, you have chosen wisely, um, there is a bright future for you. Um, and with that, let me conclude. We have the winds in our back and the future in our hands. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christian, for your inspiring words. I was equally impressed yesterday. So let's welcome Sarah from the Ministry of Climate Action in Austria. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be invited uh, to this event, uh, to this event on the occasion of the extended European Year of Rail. Um, myself, I'm going to talk uh, about research technology innovation and give you this perspective here today. Let me start with uh, the Austrian uh, position, the Austrian starting position. Um, Austria has a very ambitious goal to become climate neutral by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the European uh, Union. So, therefore, we bundle our forces. We have defined four research and innovation key areas we would like to focus on within the next years. The energy transition, the circular economy, the climate neutral cities and mobility transition, which I'm responsible for. And for all our measures in research and innovation, we have defined three impact objectives. We would like to help the Austrian business sector to become more innovative. We would like to develop technologies to overcome the climate crisis. And third, important for today, we would like to increase the number of people employed in the area of technology and innovation with a special attention to women. So, if you <laughs> would like to create new and innovative products, there will be effects also on jobs and job profiles. And on the other hand, if you would like to get to innovations, you need also skilled people. So, this is somehow an hand and egg problem. And this is the reason why we have funded over the last years a number of studies on these issues. And I have uh, brought 
uh, five postulates from this study I will be going through uh, for uh, this uh, short keynote speech. First, young people long for meaningful jobs, and I'm pretty sure the rail sector will offer them. There is a competition for the best brains, and mobility in general is not very attractive. Why? Because it's perceived as very complex, as very technology-oriented especially among women and girls. So we need to start to talk about the challenges. We heard a lot of in, from the European Commission over the last years about missions, about game-changing missions, and I think we need to take this approach to connote um, and, and or to link the, to link the um, challenge with the, or to overcome the challenges that are mostly connected, connoted with uh, problems, problems like the increasing traffic volume or the high dependency on fossil fuels. And there are high expectations from the rail sector in order to meet the shifting targets and in order to achieve climate neutrality and mobility. And the rail sector has also a very high economic factor and offers great job opportunities to achieve these visions. So we need to start to communicate to young people and especially to women that rail, uh, that rail is attractive and rail, uh, we, by working in rail, we will overcome the climate crisis. First. Second. The rail sector, and I, we heard already today, offers opportunities to work in a very international environment. We stopped thinking within borders because, as well of this conference here today, but we need to start to, and, and started to think across borders. In, on European level, there is the Europe's Rail Partnership, which is working on the European Rail Network of the Future already with support of many railways. And the European rail supply industry is a very important component in terms of European growth, innovation and also jobs. You know the numbers, I think, the best. Maybe here are some uh, um, short numbers for Austria. Uh, the Austrian rail supply industry is a very export-oriented sector with an export ratio of more than 70% and also very R&I intensive, with an R&I quota of 6%, which is very high compared to other sectors in Austria. Third, the rail sector must become even more innovative in order to meet the expectations of the mobility transition. If we would like to achieve climate neutrality in 2040, we need to believe in and we need to realize that the transport system needs rail as its backbone. In Austria, we have this defined and presented last year the Austrian Mobility Master Plan to achieve the climate neutrality and mobility, and um, there are the, here are the shifting targets. We would like to increase the share of volume of transport by eco-mobility from 30 to 47 percent by and half. We would like to turn the mobility system around. We would like to reverse the ratio of the distances traveled by car and eco-mobility from 60 to 30 to 40 to 60. And in terms of goods transport, we would like to increase the rail share of model split to 40% in European cooperation. And for all that, to achieve this, we need innovations. And for innovations, we need people, they are key. So fourth, digital technologies will transform the mobility sector for its uses on the one hand, but also for its workers. Jobs in the mobility sector in general have a high risk of automation over time. But the experts, among experts, there's no agreement on to which extent the occupations will be replaced, but there is an agreement that the occupations will be uh, shifted towards more demanding activities. So new jobs will, will arise, existing ones will change, and they will change to higher service requirements, and they bring along new job requirements. We need social skills for the service requirements, system knowledge and competence, and digital literacy will become an indispensable basic skill in the future. 
work boundaries will become more flexible, more dissolved, more decentralized, and we need to move from training to lifelong learning. And we also need to talk about risk, risk of high packaging for social dumping, which we need to avoid. And fourth, fifth, sorry, in order to exploit the potential for innovation, we need to promote diversity. We all know that women are underrepresented in mobility occupations. They are even more underrepresented in rail. It's even worse in rail freight. I think you all have the numbers. But digitalization and automation will uh, offer new opportunities for women. There will be, work models will become more flexible, heavy labor will be reduced and will be shifted to more planning and monitoring work and there will be higher or more uh, social, um, social requirements in, in order to achieve the service character of the of <coughs> occupations. And there are big opportunities for flexible, well-educated and IT-savvy workers. But how to attract women? We need fair pay, flexible working hours. We also need to talk about gender-sensitive language. In German language, we talk about female job titles, but it's not about only written communication and not about only spoken communication. It's all also about visual communication. We, this brings me to making role models also <coughs> visible. And last but not least, we need to support the networking of female experts. So these were my five postulates. And if you would like to get more information, here is the link, the list of the studies I quoted and uh, took the research from. And I wish you a very fruitful conference today. Thank you, Sarah, for these interesting numbers. And thank you all uh, for sharing your thoughts and setting the scene for this very interesting day that we have ahead. Yes, you can go. <laughs> now let's welcome Kerstin Torpman from my, uh, my unit in the Commission, who will host the ceremony for the new EAFA members. Good morning, everyone. And again, many thanks to Stefan and to Bebe. It was amazing yesterday, and it keeps continuing to be amazing. So I would like to start by giving you a brief update on the latest developments in the AFA. So let's see if I get this to work. Yeah. So our membership base keeps growing. That's, we are very happy about that. And we now have 377 new members of the Alliance. We're all together. The online community has also been a big part of our activities, especially because of the pandemic. And our LinkedIn group has close to 3,000 members now. And if any of you aren't um, there yet, you should join, because that's where you can learn about our latest activities. And it has been really important during the, the pandemic, these online events. And as you know, the Aircodis are a very excellent support service. They are arranging a lot of activities for the AFA. So over the last few years, the four years, we have had a range of events, both physical before the COVID and online afterwards. We have had webinars, we have had online training modules, we have had live discussions, and of course events both online and like this. And more recently, we also started a new activity, which is uh, podcasts. We already launched one podcast with the Commissioner Schmidt. We have already also recorded with the European Apprentice Network a new podcast. And it will be published soon, maybe next week with Marcus, who is here, and also from um, uh, apprentices that were in Barcelona. So we're really looking forward to that. And we have also planned one more this year. So our first uh, in-person event after the COVID, it was uh, in March. 
It was in Barcelona, and it was in the European Year of Youth, and it was about apprentices themselves. And um, the, the main topic was that how the voice of apprentices could be better embedded in decision-making, and which I think is very important. And that was kind of a feeling I had yesterday, too, when I visited all these young people. It's really them we are working for, and they are the future. So I think we have to have that in mind. So, the physical events have been a really great way to connect. So I'm really happy that we are here today and starting. These are pictures from the Barcelona event, which was also really nice. Uh, just to end, we have some upcoming activities that I would like to mention. We have a new uh, in-person event in, in Belgrade in October. We are having two more live discussions this year. One is a topic to be decided. I've got some couple of good ideas from Ben from the European Apprentice Network now. <laughs> and also, uh, we are planning one on cooperative practices to support SMEs and participating in apprenticeships. Uh, we are also one more podcast, as I mentioned, on quality. We want to work with social partners. Uh, we also are planning an online training module of how to communicate apprenticeships. So, and connected to this, I would just like to mention that we are having a survey, upcoming survey that will be sent to you in the next few weeks. And we would really encourage you to, to uh, reply and give us input on what you think we should, you know, like ideas and, and feedback to us what we should work with in regards to apprenticeships for the upcoming years. But now, without further ado, let us move to welcome our new members in the rail sector which is a key sector for the green and digital transition, as we will explore in the sessions today. So I will call you one by one, and when you come up here, you will sign your certificate, and then you can have a seat, because we're having a picture in the end, so please don't leave the scene after you come up here. So we have eight new members here today. UBB has been a long-standing member, and we also have one more from Rail. And five of you are here today. And the other three are following us, on, us online, and we also want to welcome them warmly. Together, they have pledged to provide almost 12,000 apprenticeship places. So it's quite a few opportunities for young people, I think, So as several mentioned. So please, let's start with SNCB. And also, if it's more representative, so like with apprentices, please come up to the stage. And <laughs> yeah, welcome. I'm <laughs> very glad. Thanks. And the next one is the International Union of Railways, UIC. And yeah. Yeah, oh, great. Welcome to EAFA. And here is a certificate. Are you signing it? So they're taking a picture. Many thanks. One more. <laughs> and welcome SNCF from France. <laughs> so welcome to the Alpha. <laughs> Here's the pen. And then this picture. And the Association of European Rail Rolling Stock Lessers. Applause 
Welcome to the Alpha family. And here's someone to sign. Okay, I should probably turn this again. Thanks, that's a picture. <laughs> Next one is Deutsche Bahn. <laughs> Welcome to the Alpha family. And here you can sign. So, picture. Thanks. And we also have uh, three other members that I mentioned that is online today. They could have unfortunately not make it here in person. And I want to thank them also and welcome them to the Alpha family. It's the Turkish State Railways, TCDD and TCDD Tajmazilik. How did I pronounce it? <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. And we also have the UNIFA, the European Rail Supply Industry Association from Belgium. <laughs> and Pro Rail from the Netherlands. <laughs> and you're all very welcome. So as usual, let's take a group picture. I don't know how you want to arrange this. Thank you very much for joining the Alpha. And we hope you enjoy this first event as much as I have done and the rest of us. Okay, how, would, how do you want the group picture? Just group together like this. Thanks. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you all, the new members of EAFA, for your commitment and your plans ahead. Um, and now we will start with the in depth sessions. So I invite uh, our first facilitator uh, to stage together with the speakers on the topic of digital and green transitions. Jörg. Hello. Stage, please. Yeah, come over, Miriam. So that's the clicker for you. So you may be sitting over there. Come here, Carl. Yeah, Miriam. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So good morning and welcome to this first uh, thematic session on the green and digital transition. My name is Jörg Markovic. I'm here from Vienna uh, working for 3S, which is a company that has specialized in research and consultancy for lifelong learning. And uh, I'd like to first introduce my dear guests here. So to my left is Carol Kuhn. And Carol Kuhn is Secretary General of the Association of European Rail Rolling Stock Lessers. And Carol has been involved in the railway sector since 30 years now, though she doesn't look that old. <laughs> First in various roles of the SNCB, so the Belgium Railway Company, uh, where she played a key role in establishing the Belgium regulatory and safety bodies. And later she uh, became engaged in more European affairs and associations. And to my right is Miriam uh, Bilage Klo. Uh, and Miriam is Deputy Human Resource Director and Head of Human Resource Development at the International Union of Railways. And as an HR development specialist, uh, Miriam has uh, quite some experiences in organizing uh, training, international training in the rail sector. 
And finally, to my very uh, left, uh, Bojan Jovanovsky. Uh, Bojan is senior lecturer at the second largest University of Applied Sciences in Austria, called FH Neum in Styria. And uh, his background is in engineering, and his uh, research focuses on issues like innovation, entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurial learning. And since last year, Bojan coordinates the Greenerwet project, uh, which we will talk about, uh, which is one of the projects which is going to establish a center of vocational excellence uh, in Vienna and other countries. Uh, he will talk about that later. Now, the idea of this session is that we start a discussion about the challenges and opportunities apprenticeship training is facing due to the train transition, the digital and green transition. And uh, we will have the opportunity to continue this discussion in the afternoon uh, session, which I'm also um, moderating. And uh, I uh, will, after the short inputs by our speakers, you will have the opportunity to join the discussion, uh, ask questions, but not only here, you in the room, but also the ones following us uh, virtually on screen. Now, the uh, employment effects, uh, as Sarah bittner krautsack uh, has already mentioned, of the um, digital transition are more than just debated. So the ones are more or less see a future world without work at all, just to quote a famous recent book title. Uh, the others uh, see us just at the beginning of an AI revolution uh, and compare that revolution with the industrial revolution where, first of all, many people lost their jobs, but after that, millions of new jobs uh, were created. And finally, the population and the standard of living increased dramatically uh, for the first time in history, actually. But also, if we think back these 200 years, then uh, we have to see the sort of damage also the industrial revolutions, and there were more than just one, have made to this planet. So clearly, the digital and green transitions are linked, uh, but there are also uh, risks uh, and challenges. So in apprenticeship, I mean, it's very hard to predict, but I can imagine that there will be some sort of deep green apprenticeship uh, programs, whereas there are others which are just light green, maybe. Uh, and on the labor market, we might uh, see even more polarization than we have already seen uh, before. There's a risk of digital divide. Uh, so there are a number of issues uh, which we can discuss uh, here. And uh, yeah, without further uh, delay and without further introduction, I would like first to ask both uh, who is not from the rail sector, I should say. However, I believe that the Greenovet project uh, has a lot of insights uh, and a lot, of, uh, a lot to offer also for the rail sector. Uh, so, yeah, simply please tell us what the project is about and what are your strategies to make vocational education and training greener, because that, I think, is what you're finally doing. So, the floor is yours, Bojan. Thank you, York. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizer for having me here. Thank you for addressing the elephant in the room. Yes, I'm not from the real sector. Uh, <laughs> I was a really, little bit worried if what we do fits. Uh, I knew that what you do fits to us. But listening to the previous uh, great speeches, I, I realized that, yes, uh, it was mentioned that uh, we should avoid duplicating the efforts in, in the EU and working together towards developing the skills that we need. Thank you. Um, and then we, um, we heard also that uh, the people are the key, and this is actually what we're trying to do. So in 2019, the European uh, Commission launched one uh, very important uh, initiative, the Centers of Vocational Excellence, uh, funded by Erasmus+. Plus. So uh, in this initiative, uh, we are establishing across Europe uh, many centers, probably in the next seven years in total, there will be around 100 centers like this, focusing on different topics, uh, joining different uh, stakeholders, but with one very important joint uh, goal to interconnect the skills ecosystem and exactly that, to create the skills that we, are, uh, we will need in the future. Uh, our project, Renovet, 
is in the uh, started in 2020. Very crazy year to start uh, such initiative. Um, it's uh, it started in uh, November. It will last for four years. It has budget of almost 4.5 uh, million euros, and we have uh, four regions involved, so Styria in Austria, but we extend it in the meantime to al almost all of the Austria, uh, then uh, Portugal, uh, North Macedonia and Finland. Uh, in, when we started, it was really hard to, to explain to people what we are trying to do and what we are uh, referring to uh, when we talk about skills, what we are referring to when we are talking about uh, the, the skills ecosystems, and I hope I will um, manage to explain it relatively simple to all of you because, because you know the, the landscape. Actually, what we are trying to do is to have in every region at least one representative from um, vet education on secondary and on tertiary level, to have at least one uh, company uh, or business industry representative in each region, which will communicate with, with the vet providers and tell them what the industry needs, but also have uh, at least in the um, external partners or associated partners, governmental institutions and NGOs that will, that will facilitate this process. What is the key um, challenge here is that we are not focusing on um, filling in the gaps in the labor market today. What we're doing is we're analyzing what we're going to need uh, in the future for the green transition. And based on, on, on this uh, forecast to uh, create the links between the labor market uh, and industry, uh, based on those forecasts to create the skills, but not only the skills of the learners today, but first to start with creating skills of the educators that will be able to uh, provide and develop uh, those uh, future skills for the, for the market. So, um, as I said, we started with, with forecasting and understanding. And it was much harder than, than we imagined, because every region has its own specifics based on their smart specialization strategies. And then, uh, through a deep uh, analysis and understanding, we saw that even though they're all different and we have specific um, occupations that will be needed for the green transition in each region, there are some things in common. Um, many of them find digital technologies as very important. Um, many of them uh, find the energy technologies or energy transition very important. Um, and of course, uh, the food is one of the uh, important sectors that will influence both the quality of living and uh, the, the environmental protection. So um, through this, and including the mobility as one of the important uh, sectors for at least some of them, uh, we managed to, um, to, to find joint uh, topics on which we should focus. But the main thing that we are doing is that we are going through the same system, uh, we are sharing experiences for the process, and we are learning from each other how to do things, and then, for these relevant topics, we are sharing knowledge, we are sharing experiences. And, for example, next week, starting on Monday, we have our meeting and then uh, capacity building training in Skopje, where we are going to invite uh, world-class experts that are going to teach us or, or share with us and work with us on how to make our centers sustainable. Unlike the occupations for the generic skills, it was much easier to realize which, uh, regions, uh, which, which skills will be relevant for the region. So we realized that we will need creative people in every sector, we will need critical thinking, uh, and we will need people at every level, at every profession, to uh, be aware of uh, what they can do in their job to protect the environment. And this sounds simple, but it will be a huge challenge to uh, implement this um, throughout the, the whole educational system, but we have good ideas and we're already uh, working on that. Um, at the end, I, I would like just to, to state that we have four centers, as I mentioned, and each of them have different structure, if each of them has different way of governing, but we're all going towards the, the same goal. Why I'm stressing this? Because uh, what we're doing should not stay limited to our four regions. So, as I maybe mentioned in the beginning, skills for a green Europe is our slogan of the project, but also it's our vision and our challenge. So please join us in this ride, and if you think that whatever we are doing can support you, or even more, if you think that what you are doing can support our efforts, please contact us and, and join us. Thank you. Mm.
Thank you, Bojan. I think in the introduction it was uh, mentioned several times by our speakers that more cooperation is needed. I think this is an interesting example where you see both cooperation at the regional level combined with cooperation at the international level. So thank you, Bojan. Uh, now coming to Carol. Um, it's probably clear to all rail experts in the room what your association is doing, but uh, there are a few non-experts here, so maybe you could first explain. <laughs> maybe you could first explain what your association is doing, and uh, yeah, and then simply explain why you think we need more training uh, in the rail sector in particular in the maintenance, and how is that related to green and digital issues? Thank you, Jörg. Yeah, maybe I'm also a kind of elephant in the room because I'm from the new railway sector. Uh, you can see here the logo of my members. They are called uh, lessors, Ro Rosco, uh, leasing companies. They are leasing rolling stock to railway undertaking, and most of the time they are leasing locomotives to new entrants on the rail freight market. As you probably know, the rail freight market has been liberalized in 2003, and uh, what we call the challengers, so the new entrants, uh, have now uh, about 47% of the market. So the, the leasing uh, activities uh, started uh, at the beginning of the year uh, 2000s and grew uh, rapidly um, and I hope will uh, grow more and more in the next years also on the passenger market, which is also liberalized now. So uh, what we are doing is leasing uh, locomotives, mainly locomotives uh, and our association, Association of European Rail Rolling Stock Lessors, is a representative body of the railway sector at EU level, which means that we are meeting um, on a regular basis with the DG Move and with the European Railway Agency to uh, discuss about the future rail policy. And our purpose, of course, is to promote interoperable and safe European rail rolling stock, which is really key for the future of the rail. So, as I said, it's a growing, um, it's a growing, um, it's not the last version, <laughs> uh, it's a growing business, uh, so this is what we are doing. It's a growing business um, and it's also very key for a greener transport for the future. Rail transport is considered as green transport as such. So I won't speak about the, the green aspects. Uh, just as an illustration, a, a higher model share of 30% of rail freight by 2030, which is higher than the real target, would uh, save uh, 290 million tons of CO2 emissions uh, in Europe. But I will talk mainly about the digital aspects. In fact, rail is currently uh, being digitalized, and the first step, the backbone of the digitalization is the ETCS, European Train Control System, so a signaling and control component of the European Rail Traffic Management System. Um, it's currently in deployment, uh, but it should be uh, fully deployed in 2040, and even deployed on the main lines of the European network in 2030, which means that, of course, the lo locomotive has to have to be equipped too. For the time being, 30% uh, of the, the lessors locomotives are already equipped with ETCS. Growing business also because, by the, because of the target of uh, the European policy, plus 50% uh, for, rail, rail, for rail freight traffic in 2030 and plus 100% for high-speed traffic. In this framework, we signed uh, the EFA pledge for three, with three targets. More uh, apprentice places, uh, a better uh, image for apprenticeship in in general, but mainly in our uh, in our activity, uh, 
and more mobility for apprentices um, in, in our workshops. Our commitment is plus new, uh, thousand new places in five years' time. Uh, I'm not a, a human resource expert, so I set up a thematic committee within my association with the human resource uh, experts. And we, we are working together and we, we will meet um, on a monthly basis to, to make it real. What are we doing precisely? We are doing operational leasing, which means preventive maintenance, repair, spare parts and components management, 24 by 7 emergency hotline, technical updates and further developments. Main, all these tasks are mainly performed in workshops called Entity in Charge of Maintenance that has to be uh, certified uh, by certification body at EU level. Our focus uh, is put on the uh, function 3 and 4 of the ECM, which is in fact really the maintenance delivery function. ECM4 is technical ex execution of works defined in the maintenance file and ordered by the fleet maintenance management function. So we need much more technicians uh, with um, uh, hardware and software skills and also with human skills. Because if you have to go uh, on site uh, in case of uh, breakdown of locomotive, you have to be able to, 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 to speak with the driver and to, to understand what happened to be able to solve the problem. So what are our recruitment issues? We are uh, working on a very competitive sector. We are in competition with other sectors, many other sectors. We are on a very small market. We need certifications. Uh, there are barriers to mobility, so um, English in workshop is not uh, always easy because uh, people uh, mainly remain in their workshop and uh, mobility between workshops and between uh, uh, different countries is not easy. And our people, our workers have to have both technical, including digital and human skills. So this is very difficult to, to find um, for the fresh blood we need. So we think that the two conditions uh, that could help us to reach our targets is to have good partnerships with VET and university. And when I say good partnerships, it means that we have to conceive together uh, the programs um, because for the time being, it's not the case. So we would like to be on board to define, to, to collaborate in definition of the programs with university or, uh, or schools. And the second um, condition that would also help us is to have a, a kind of standardization of harmonization of the status of apprentice in uh, Europe uh, through an EU regulation to help in uh, in mobility between uh, the different countries. Okay. Thank you. This is it. Um, yeah, there, yes, some applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's, um, I mean, we, we heard also this morning of the raising uh, skills requirements, so a certain trend towards uh, higher qualifications, uh, apparently. You now mentioned the cooperation with university, you mentioned also higher apprenticeship. I think that's a topic we probably need to come back to, and it's quite, because everything is so focused here in the discussion on apprenticeship, we shouldn't forget that there are other sectors in education, and of course it's a big question in some countries how the relation of apprenticeship to higher education is organized. Some see this as competitions, the others see, uh, see that as a sort of cooperation and collaboration. So I think that's definitely one topic uh, I hope we can come back to in the discussion. Uh, now to the next speaker, Miriam. First of all, congratulations, because I think the International Union of Railway celebrates its 100th yes. anniversary. Congratulations for that. 
um, now, considering the future challenges of the green and digital transition and the various uh, crises we are currently uh, facing, I mean, how do you envisage uh, the future for the sector? I mean, maybe not for the next 100 years, <laughs> but <laughs> for the next 10 to 30 years, uh, I would be really interested to get an insight yeah. from an HR specialist on that. Okay, so um, before, uh, so thank you for giving me the floor. So let's see what is UIC first, for of those course. who don't know what is UIC. Uh, so as you said, UIC is celebrating its uh, one century, so serving the railway community, so we represent members, as is NCF, UBB and uh, other railway stakeholders. Okay, so you can see. So let's move because I think my presentation is too long. <laughs> So let's see the video, it's better. What is UIC, the International Union of Railways? UIC is an international organization bringing together railways and major rail sector stakeholders from across the world. Specifically, UIC is 240 members from 100 countries, representing 1 million root kilometers and 7 million men and women working daily to serve customers in optimum comfort and safety. UIC is the tool created by the world's railway to enable joint working, thinking, action, and progress. UIC is first and foremost a repository of railway expertise and a forum for sharing experience and seeking solutions whose aim is to bring about greater consistency between railways worldwide. In particular, it is at UIC that current and future operating standards are first developed. Taking the form of UIC coordinated projects, this corporation boosts railway's efficiency and attractiveness the world over. It also facilitates the development of international rail links, which benefit all rail users. UIC's second major remit is to help the railways prepare for the future. For each region of the world, UIC has drawn up a strategic vision offering a consistent framework for railway development. One part of preparing for the future is investing in innovation, new technologies, and digitalization. UIC is coordinating some 200 technical projects and is involved in studies featuring involvement from all sector stakeholders. Lastly, UIC's educational and training programs are preparing future generations of rail managers to meet the challenges of the market and society. Railways have appointed UIC as their global spokesperson. This role is specifically recognized by the UN, where UIC represents the rail sector. UIC is today the go-to contact partner for international organizations of all types, whether political, economic, or financial, when they want to talk to the railways. UIC also has a long-standing cooperation with a number of other bodies and has concluded agreements to this effect. Yes, so <laughs> I have another video, <laughs> sorry. So as you have seen, so the key challenges of UIC as innovation or transmission uh, are about how to help the railway sector and the community to drive sustainability, sustainable mobility sorry, forward. So how can we do this? is by designing a better future for our railways. So, and we work at UIC on developing projects, and let's some, see some of them, sorry, another video, because I think it's, it's good to have videos too. <laughs> to, yeah, and to see some um, UIC technical solutions that are linked with our subject. The 136 working groups of the UIC, the International Union of Railways, develop technical solutions in all areas of railway business. Let's take a tour around some examples of the output they have achieved. First to infrastructure. Key topics covered include safety at level crossings and the use of artificial intelligence for predictive maintenance. Preventing broken rails being a good example. Zooming onto the high-speed railway, 
UIC recently published six IRSs, International Railway Solutions, designed to assist stakeholders and decision makers in the design, construction and operation of new high-speed systems. The Rail System Model, launched by UIC in 2013, provides a solid, consistent foundation that is necessary for digitally modelling the railway system. In freight, the loading guidelines are in daily use as a pillar of safe freight operation. Similarly, the IRS is on the codification of combined transport and the quality of dangerous goods transportation play an important part in improving sector productivity. UIC is leading the design of the Future Rail Mobile Communication System, or FRMCS for short. As the successor to the soon-to-be outdated GSMR, it will further enable digitization of the railway network by being the key foundational support for all future ground-to-train communication applications. OSDM, or Open Sales and Distribution Model, standardizes the computer messages between ticket offices, points of sale and commercial conditions. So there you have a very quick tour of UIC's technical solutions. The UIC is proud that all of this is undertaken for the benefit not only of UIC member companies, but also for the end users and all stakeholders engaged in railway transportation. Okay, so my five minutes is over. <laughs> So we can continue then. <laughs> okay. So to achieve our goals and then to, because as you have seen, uh, future is changing. A lot of digitalization, sustainability, and all these uh, technical matters that you've seen in the videos. So to achieve those goals, we need new job acquirements. So we need to work on new skills. So, so we do this at UIC by helping our members on achieving their goals and by, uh, as, uh, sorry, as a global rail association, so we work on identifying new skills. Uh, we do this uh, through UIC projects financed by our members and through European projects as Erasmus Plus or other projects. So we are very active. As an employer, so we also hire apprentices and internship inside UIC and we support them with career planning and job opportunities uh, at UIC or within our members too. So, um, I will move, sorry, yes, this is more important. So these are UIC main strategic topics. What you, have, you can see in green, it's um, where we have uh, hired apprentices at UIC working on uh, our members' projects. So as you can see, you have them into digitalization, predictive maintenance, climate change, noise, sustainable end use. You have, uh, we have one of our apprentices here working with sustainability. We hear him uh, this afternoon. Um, on high speed, on commuter. So you can see lots of topics on signaling. So we, in all these areas, we have apprentices and internship uh, uh, programs. So there are future engineers, future technicians, and uh, we are glad at the end to hire them if they want to stay at UIC or they have links with our members do, uh, through their projects. So to conclude, to not stay so long, <laughs> uh, just um, I will see what Carol said uh, at, just at the end, that we need to work all together in the railway sector um, to ensure smooth digital green uh, transition. Because as we have seen, jobs are changing, so we need to change too, and we need to work with universities. We work a lot with universities in the European projects too. And um, we work on training, and we have a congress at the end of the year on railway training, the World Congress, so just join us some advertisement, <laughs> so yeah, and uh, it's really nice congress, so please come and join us there. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Miriam. I mean, if watching the video and what you said, I always, and also from your part, I see more and higher and advanced skills requirement everywhere. But we also heard uh, in the keynote this morning that there is uh, automation, of course, taking place, so jobs are offset. And uh, I would really be interested to discuss uh, also later, maybe in the afternoon, with you to which extent we, on the one hand, see uh, apprenticeship occupations threatened by automation, and on the other hand, uh, we see more advanced apprenticeships, maybe. But it's now time to open the floor for a Q&A, so um, um, also our audience uh, following on the screen. Um, if you have any specific questions to the presenters or any general remarks, any general comments you would like to bring in, we have at least 10 or 12 minutes uh, open for discussion now. Yeah, we have microphones over there, so. Uh, good morning, my name is Simon Hawthorne from the uh, European Apprentice Network. Um, thank you all of you for your brilliant presentations. It's wonderful to see that you're all putting forward aspirations for apprenticeships in VUT across Europe and collaboration is a wonderful word and I want to see that used much more by everyone in this room. Um, one of the things which I'd like to ask is about not just, obviously, pro-apprentice, but uh, how do we embed lifelong learning so that uh, employees already within our companies and our communities are able to transition to these new, greener and more interesting technologies so that we don't leave anyone behind and bring everyone along on the journey? Yeah, thank you. Are there just more questions already? There's a second question. We take second one on board, maybe. Yeah. Yes, th thanks, Jörg. Um, yes, in fact, I would like to know if the European support that we have nowadays available, like the uh, Centers of Vocational Excellence or the Pact for Skills and other funding under Erasmus, uh, are being useful and, and used for your purposes, or if you can think about other EU support that could help you in your objectives. Um, for instance, I, I heard Carol uh, talking about how partnerships are important. So we have the Pact for Skills, we have uh, platforms for centers of vocational excellence that could be helpful, but I don't know how you are doing this, if these are helpful or you would need other tools. And um, I also uh, heard Boyan talking about many, uh, let's say, uh, transversal skills that are needed for the green transition. And we also had this green comp project. And I was wondering whether you are actually using this for your project. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, three questions. First, on um, the lifelong learning uh, issue. I mean, this morning it was uh, said as a need for where we have to go into the future, but maybe from the ones who are from the rail sector here, Miriam and Carol, what's already in place and what are your plannings in terms of uh, also upskilling the existing workforce? So what are the lifelong learning uh, options you already offer and what which you are, um, are planning, so to Say, and if you like, of course, you can also uh, tackle the second question. The third question I will then hand over to Boyan. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I prefer to focus on the second question because yeah? I'm not okay. a uh, human resource expert, <laughs> so for life, lifelong learning, it's not my, my point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so, indeed, um, uh, to be very concrete, we are not involved for the time being, so as I say, when I say we, my members, so the, the, the leasing companies are not involved in the conception of the, the, the legal programs for, for apprentices. So we, uh, we are using apprentices, but we are never sure that uh, they are receiving from the educational system the theoretical part they need to become a perfect worker in our company. And we are very, um, for us, the lowest cost for uh, each activity is, is very important. So we are uh, employing apprentices, but we are never sure that they will stay uh, in our company and that the, the, they have the, the good uh, theoretical um, approach, I would say. 
so I, th I think that in some countries, uh, bachelor in rolling stock are existing, uh, for instance, here in Austria. But I think that Austria could be an exception. Uh, in a lot of European countries, there are no bachelor with a, a rail orientation. Uh, or with a, uh, a rolling, rail rolling stock orientation. And this is what we need. We need more diploma, more, um, more apprentices with real rail orientation, not only for the practical part, but also for the theoretical part. So, yes, we need your support for that. Okay. Coming to the, the first question on yeah, lifelong for, learning. Yeah, for the lifelong learning, yeah. We, we support our employees for that because we have... Um, annual plan for the whole staff. They have uh, interviews each year uh, to see if they need some new skills, and then we pay for their training at UIC. So it's uh, each year we have these interviews. We uh, see if they need some new skill for one project because the projects are. We have a lot of projects, even uh, technical ones and uh, we look for the right training for the right project. So we, st we, we had to do that because it's going so fast. So yes, we do it. Okay. So and do you don't see any sort of split between what's done for initial training on the one hand and for continuing training on the other hand? You see this as Yes, as a global. If, okay. Even the apprentices, they have their own training at the universities or schools. It depends from where they are coming. But um, we train them for other things if they really need it. For example, they come at UIC, they need some digital skills because they don't know our tools and all the, these things, our extranet, for example. Or, so we train them on IT, uh, for example, um, topics. Or for railways, for example. They don't know railways, so then we train them for railways to know how it works because they don't come from the, rail, from the railways, and we are not railway stakeholder. We represent our members, so they need, they, they need to know how it works, how is the system. So we train them uh, every day, <laughs> and they have these uh, annual interviews, and they're integrated with our employees too. So they, they have these interviews, and we train them. Okay, thank you. There was a very specific question to yes. you, Bojan. Do you have an answer? Yes, of course. <laughs> Fine. Um, th this is the problem when you, when you are among the, the pioneers sometimes. We started the project in 2020, in November. We started our research in January. We finished it in July. And if I'm not mistaken, the Green Co uh, was published in October or November. Um, so our reaction was, oh, we just finished our research, but... Uh, this is even better because the green comp is, is very useful too. Uh, so now we, we can compare our findings with what the team in the commission did and hopefully we will uh, be in touch with, with them for the future activities because what will be the next step is to develop different kinds of tools based on it. Some for measurement, some for development of, of different training and teaching materials. There are many things that, that are following now in the next phase because, as I mentioned, uh, it's very important for us to, to develop the skills, but we are not working uh, directly, that's not entirely true, but we are not focused mainly on the learners. Uh, we have some activities with them, like awareness raising for VET, like some competitions, which are always also done for awareness raising and, and pushing the whole ecosystem. But mainly we are, we are focused on creating the, the links, the system and the skills of the, of the trainers. So maybe connected to the second question, of course, I'm very biased because we, we're mainly funded by the commission. This is um, the, um, the project, apart from the money, it's also the legal framework that is supporting us to do what we're doing, and we're very grateful and happy about it. Uh, but uh, also what we are really happy in this program is that uh, we really have uh, support from the commission and from the agency to do the process. So this is, I work in EU projects for 15 years, and this is the first time when the Commission is so much engaged to, to promote the whole program and through that the projects. And this is really helpful for us, um, making us more visible, and um, that helps us being accepted also in our communities by our uh, stakeholders. And I think it will be very helpful if the Commission also supports further development of the um, follow-up materials and tools uh, related to the, to the green comp, because I, I think that if we are aiming at the goals for 2050, we'll have a lot of things to do in the next uh, almost three decades. Yeah. Thank you. 
As I'm also following up this uh, project, I think it's very interesting to see in Austria how you manage to cooperate between university and this upper secondary level, because that's not, not a natural thing to do, uh, I would say, at least not in Austria. Um, and uh, there, of course, European money, uh, which is able, so to say, to bridge the various uh, educational areas and the various uh, levels uh, is definitely well invested. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. One over there. I can take a second one, maybe, depending on the question, of course. <laughs> no? uh, okay. Good morning to all. I'm Joaquim Santos from um, the National Federation of Education in Portugal. Uh, my question is uh, the following one. You all focused uh, the importance of social skills and transversal skills. What kind of these skills do you consider more important? Okay. So, um, I mean, we can hear the voice from the practice as HR specialists, but also I know, Boyan, you did your analysis, so uh, I'm sure you also have to say something about that. Who wants first? Okay. Would you like? No, for, for, for um, me it's fine. No, <laughs> thanks. Um, so the question was, which are more important, the, the technical or the transversal or the social? Okay. Yeah, please. From our perspective, the social skills are part of the transversal skills. That's why I'm... I'm, I'm asking to understand the question, because how we see it, there are uh, occupation or profession specific skills, like we saw yesterday. Um, depending on what person will work, there are specific technical uh, skills that, that are needed. Uh, and, and this for us is one category that needs to be addressed for the specific occupation or profession that the person will have. When we talk about the transversal skills, uh, we include here combination of different environmental, social, um, communication, um, life skills, including languages and things like that. Of course, um, very special, very large group of skills are the digital skills. Because part of them are in the transversal skills or the, or the life skills. So to a level that we need to be uh, digitally literate and, and be able to do common everyday things from checking uh, emails and uh, using web search to going up with uh, some complexity of using Excel to, to going up in, in specific occupation related, as we saw yesterday, using of softwares or even creating specific softwares. So in that sense, there is overlapping between the transversal, transversal and um, um, occupation related skills. But uh, why we divide them? Because for us, it's important to understand what needs to be addressed systematically at all level in all professions and what we as society need to be able to do. Um, around 20 years ago, in the meantime, we had the, the Lisbon Declaration when we had the 10 skills, among which, of course, it was communication in um, mother tongue, foreign language, mathematical skills, entrepreneurship, and I'm missing few. And uh, what we're discussing now in our project and what is coming uh, also with the green comp is that uh, being environmentally aware and, and being aware of how your actions are influencing the environment is one of the other life skills that we, we will have to develop in Europe if we want to succeed with the tw uh, 2050 agenda. Okay. I hope I answered the question. I'm not <laughs> sure. because <laughs> okay. I think the question related also to the relation of specific skills versus transversal skills. So only a very short final thought, I, whether I, you I, see here yeah, uh, a sort I, of I'm trend sure towards I, the one I or the other. the difference, but um, at two I see where we work a lot on projects. So we have human factors uh, approach. So we put people with uh, transversal skills to work out together. It's a systemic approach. So it's important that they master, uh, if they work, for example, on a threat project, that they know what is sustainability and what is, for example, uh, how it works, the tracks works. Or they, they, we, we need them to have this systemic point of view, so they need to be transversal. So this is something that is very important. And then there are the technical skills, and then it's something that you, you need to have if depending on the topic you are working on. So I think this is a systemic approach. We cannot say 
it's better. The one or the yeah, other. it's. Uh, I think we have to to think globally. So it's. Uh, Okay, but definitely I think we will take this question on the relation of technical skills and transversal skills in the rail sector also into the discussion at the afternoon. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your inputs and the discussion. Thank you also for the question. Um, and I'm happy to close this uh, first thematic session now, giving the floor back to Anna. And I think we have deserved a break now. Yeah? Thank yes, you. indeed. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Welcome. I learned many words, UEC, ECTS, uh, a lot of food for thought. I'm sure all our participants will jump on you to uh, clarify questions uh, during the coffee break. So now we have 30 minutes coffee break and we reconvene at 11.15 to continue with the in-depth session on gender equality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. So welcome back. I'm sure you had uh, the occasion to meet other colleagues from other countries and discuss over the very interesting topics that uh, we are looking into today. And now we have the second in-depth session on gender equality for apprenticeships in the rail sector. And as you see, we have a full panel uh, of women, and it will be facilitated by, by Vicky Donaghy uh, from uh, Ecoris. Uh, so, Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna, and welcome everybody to this uh, panel focusing, uh, as Anna was saying, on gender equality in apprenticeships in the rail sector. Um, I've been delighted to hear it's a topic which has come up already several times um, during this morning already, and thank you to all the speakers who've already mentioned it. Um, but I think we were also all very struck, those of us who had the pleasure to go to the OBB training center yesterday to see how many um, young female apprentices were also uh, among the group there. Um, so um, my name is Vicky Donlevy, um, as Anna said, so I'm a director at Ecoris and also direct the apprenticeship support services which we support the commission with. Um, so on this uh, topic today, as we know, uh, all of us who are here and those who are online, um, apprenticeships do offer real possibilities in terms of employability, in terms of gaining skills and competences, but there are still obstacles, um, there is still stigma, um, which stops enough young people uh, coming into apprenticeships, um, and industry is crying out for the skills which um, apprenticeships can provide. Um, so there is a need now more than ever to reach out to newer, more diverse target groups in terms of apprenticeships. Um, and among those, of course, uh, this is in particular women who we know, um, despite what we saw at the training center yesterday, we know are strongly underrepresented in apprenticeships and in particular, in particular sectors such as the rail sector. So our panel today, um, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, um, we're going to be looking at some of the challenges um, which are there, um, but also all the activities that are being put in place and need to be put in place, including the commitments that we've seen from the Austrian uh, railways um, about how we can tackle this problem and ensure that there are more uh, young women coming into apprenticeships in the rail sector. Um, so I'm delighted to have a panel here, here today, which I will present, um, who are going to discuss these challenges uh, with us. Um, and so first of all um, is going to be Jeda Holovain, um, who is a policy, the policy officer for railways at the European Transport Workers Federation. Um, so she will be speaking first and giving us that European uh, overview from the um, social partners uh, point of view. And then I'm delighted um, that on my right we have Heather Waugh, um, who was the first uh, female train driver in the freight sector uh, in Scotland, representing uh, women in rail, so um, somebody who has really direct experiences of the challenges, so delighted that she's there with us. And then on my left, um, we have two representatives from um, the train sector industry. So firstly, uh, Katrine, who we met earlier um, for getting her award, so who is internship coordinator at um, SNCB, so the Belgian Railways. Um, and then Ursula Bazant, uh, who is head of department for education and training at OBB, who was kind enough to welcome us yesterday uh, at the lunch um, event. So we will be discussing um, the panel here in the same as before. There will be uh, short presentations from each of the speakers. Um, and then uh, at the end, we hope there'll be time for some questions for you and some debate with you and the people who are watching online. Um, and as also for the session this morning, um, the discussions will continue in a workshop session this afternoon where we can go into uh, even more discussions on this topic. So I hope lots of you will also join us there. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn to uh, the first speaker, who is Jeda Holovain. Uh, we'll pass the clicker down to you. Thank you very much, Jeda. Thank you, Vicky, for that introduction. Um, I would like to start by showing you a few headlines from the past few months. 
um, that illustrate what we have also been talking about this morning, and namely the, the huge shortage of skilled workers that we are facing in the sector. Um, and I'm showing you just first to illustrate the issue, also to be a bit provocative, which I think as a trade unionist in a room full of policymakers and employers is also my job. Um, because this is an issue that trade unions have been warning about for quite a while. And the reason for that, I'll show you in the next slide, is that when you look at the demographic uh, divide in the sector, and specifically at the age division, you see that in many European countries, as we discussed already previously, um, the, the working population in the railway sector is relatively old. Uh, in some countries, uh, more than half of the workers are over 50 years old. And what this means is that in the next 10 to 15 years, these workers are going to enjoy their very well-deserved retirement. But what they leave behind is... Uh, an even bigger shortage of workers, and also what they take with them is a lot of experience that is lost. Um, so all of this to say that it's very essential at the moment specifically to make working in the railway sector more attractive, um, especially for underrepresented groups such as young workers and also such as women. Um, currently, um, roughly in Europe, about one in five railway workers is a woman. Um, and when we look at different countries, we see that the picture looks quite different from one member state to the next. So we see, for example, um, that in Sweden, um, they reach about 40% of female workers in the sector. But when we look at our host country today, at Austria, the, the picture is quite different and the, they struggle to reach 13%. So the numbers that you see on the screen are the result of a monitoring project that the ETF has been doing together with the employers at the European European level, the CER, um, that have monitored the representation of women in the sector for several years. Um, and what we've also found is that there is a very big difference from one profession in the sector to the next. So when you look, for example, at locomotive drivers, we see that the underrepresentation of women is far, far bigger. Uh, Belgium here is doing relatively the best, but even Belgium is struggling to reach 5% of female locomotive drivers. Um, on the other hand, if we look at onboard staff, the picture is again completely different. We see there that women are much better represented and some countries such as Germany and Slovakia are almost reaching the 50-50 threshold. Um, but still, over the years that we have been monitoring this, we have seen that the progress has been very slow. This number of about one in five workers being a woman has been relatively stable over the past year. And this has been the main reason that um, at European level, together with the employers, we have decided to start negotiations for a binding agreement to encourage more women um, in the railway sector. And I am happy to say that these negotiations have been successful. Uh, last November, we have reached a binding social partner agreement that covers eight different so policy areas. You see them here on the screen. I won't read them all out to you. Um, but these binding agreements, um, with these binding agreements, companies have committed themselves to improving the safety and comfort of women at work to attract more women to the sector. And this covers areas such as uh, making sure that women have well-fitting personal protective equipment, well-fitting boots, well-fitting helmets, um, but also things such as preventing sexual harassment or closing the gender pay gap. And what I think is most relevant for the topic that we're talking about today, apprenticeships, is chapter three, which focuses on recruitment. And in this, uh, in this chapter, all the employers that are associated to the CR have committed themselves to making sure that job profiles and job advertisements for new jobs are formulated in a gender neutral way and appeal in the same way to men as they do to women, that interviews are conducted in a gender neutral way, as well as that they will promote um, working and doing apprenticeships in the sector more intensively in schools and universities. So this, this all with the intention to make the sector more attractive for female workers. Then, I would also like to say a few words on another uh, group that is underrepresented in the sector, namely young workers, and that's the focus of today. 
Um, at ETF, we also organize young workers in the rail sector, and uh, we have meetings with them to discuss uh, what attracted them to work in the sector in the first place, but also what they think needs to happen or needs to change about the sector to make it more attractive for their age group. And when we, had these, we started these discussions with them, we were thinking about um, discussions about innovation, about training, about all these kinds of topics, but we were, we were sort of surprised to find that what we ended up talking about was far more classic topics. Um, in the past, historically, working in the railway sector was a career, a career for life. And this is something that in recent decades of liberalization has changed a lot. Working conditions in the sector have not improved uh, as a result of liberalization. In fact, contracts are being more and more precarious. There are more uh, fixed term contracts. There is more insecurity. Wages are under pressure from competition. Um, and all of this, of course, doesn't make joining the sector more attractive. Young people join the sector and they see that their contract is worse than that of their older colleagues. They see that their wages are lower, their benefits are worse. And of course, when you enter a sector, this is not something that is encouraging for you to stay in that sector, especially in the current labor market where uh, young, skilled workers are in very high demand. So um, to wrap up, because I think my time is running out, um, I would say that to, to make uh, apprenticeships more in the railway more attractive for young workers and for women specifically, the jobs in the railway sector need to be attractive for them in the first place. Because what better way to encourage someone to start an apprenticeship than to have a good job prospect with fair wages and good working conditions in your future? Thank you so much, uh, Yeda, for being on time, um, but also really for this um, important overview of the, the place of women within the rail sector um, within Europe, and really interesting to hear the initiatives that are taking place um, from the trade unions. Uh, Electric freight trains across the country exporting the wonderful Scottish goods to our friends in Europe. We were the country that voted against Brexit. <laughs> don't applaud, I've no time, don't applaud. <laughs> so I get to do my bit for the economy and the environment. And as you can see there, um, my office view isn't too bad either. How, how do yours compare to these? This is what I get every day. It's constantly changing and it's absolutely stunning. It makes me so proud to be entrusted with these trains. Can you imagine being at the front of that? In the darkest days of the COVID crisis, we had people applauding as we passed through train stations. What an absolute privilege and an honour to drive these trains and call myself a train driver. And I have never, genuinely never loved what I do more than I do right now. So the travesty for me is that I so nearly did not apply. Now I'm not easily intimidated but this is still an industry that leaves women questioning if they belong. You wonder if you'll be accepted, if you'll face sexism or discrimination. And actually the reality for me has been incredibly positive. My colleagues and my manager were genuinely welcoming and supportive. It's the best decision I've ever made. So how many women are missing out in jobs and careers that they'd potentially love? And just as importantly, what are we missing out by not having more of them? And yes, there are misconceptions, but the truth is we're still not doing enough to redress decades of unconscious bias. We are still expecting women to adapt and conform to an industry that was designed by men for men. And that's not said with any bitterness. The most supportive of male allies cannot design a railway that works equally well for women any more than I can design a house that works for someone visually impaired. We can guess, but we don't know what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes. So here are a few examples. You'll have heard them before. Uniforms and PPE that simply don't fit. News flash. Unisex does not exist. It's menswear with the labels changed. It's simply not acceptable to hand women safety gear that was designed for the average man and then expect her to believe that you value her safety as much. You try coupling up a loco 
with sleeves down to here, or with gloves with the fingers bent over. It's not just uncomfortable, it's simply not safe. Or when safety boots start at a size six or seven, you've immediately excluded around 80% of the female workforce and population. Or risk assessments that are based on the average man that result in so many practices and procedures that can be harmful to the average woman. Or depots that have no female or gender neutral toilets. Yes, these still exist. Or there is a toilet, but it's in a different building and you have to go and find the person that has the key. That's humiliating and embarrassing. If you create an environment that doesn't work for 50% of the population, why are we surprised when women turn their, back, their backs on our industry? All these little things just keep sending a message that maybe you don't belong, or maybe you're just not worth considering. And I guarantee there will be cases in your own place of work, and you've just not seen them. And it's why we need to educate ourselves and spend time walking in the shoes of others. Because equality and diversity aren't about being treated the same. It's understanding our different needs and addressing them. And it's about creating an environment where people can be themselves. And in doing so, they're able to give so much more back. Create an industry that attracts and keeps women and young people. It doesn't just bring in talent but it helps you get more from the talent you've already got. So how do we achieve that? So many things, but for starters, we need more women in the boardrooms, not just one or two to make the picture look good. You will never achieve a diverse workforce if you, want, if you don't have policy makers that reflect the people you want to attract. And in the picture there are some of the, the leaders who've inspired or encouraged me. It makes a huge difference. So I'm asking you, male and female, to have a look at the world around you with fresh eyes and see where you can make improvements. But you also need to ask yourself what you want to achieve and why. Do you just want to bring people in and see your figures look better on paper? Or do you want to create a workplace that actually keeps the new talent? Do you want to see that perfect picture photo on your website? Or do you genuinely want to see the benefits that an inclusive and diverse workforce brings? Like the energy we saw yesterday at the UBB training centre, that's diversity. Because if you make that your focus, then you're more likely to deliver the changes that benefit your organisation. And finally, I'm asking you to make it personal because it's easy to get lost in policy. This is me and my dad. He worked in the railway for over 45 years and he sadly died before I joined. And people tell me he would be really proud to see me driving these trains. And, and I know that he would be. But if that little girl had told her dad that she wanted to join the railway, he'd have been horrified because he knew it was an environment that wasn't fit for her. And things have changed for the better, but not all experiences are as positive as mine. And we are still expecting women and other minorities to adapt. So have a look at these other photos and do you see your own family there? And ask yourself honestly, if your daughter, your niece, your granddaughter wanted to enter the industry, would you be happy if she faced any unfair limitations or biases? And can you say that she definitely won't? And if the honest answer is no, then you need to change that. Don't make policies that you wouldn't be happy seeing someone you love work with. This is a fantastic industry, so let's get it right. So that when it is someone that you love who wants to join, we'll give them an environment that they'll excel in for their benefit and for the benefit of our industry. Because when you create an environment that works for women, you create an environment that everyone will excel in and your company will benefit as a result. That should be your why, and it's up to every single one of us to make that happen. Thanks for listening, and thanks for not shouting at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well. You're only applauding because you didn't understand a word I said. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I think the reaction uh, says it all, Heather. So really, thank you so much for yeah, these really important and inspiring and yeah, insightful messages into how we can move forward on these questions. And yeah, I feel a bit tearful. <laughs> it was uh, so wonderful to see that reaction. Um, and yeah, I think you on your own would be a recruitment machine for, for getting women into the into the rail sector. I'm so applying I think to ABB as we speak. Oh, that's it, yeah. <laughs> so it's a hard act to follow, Katrine. <laughs> Um, but I will now hand the floor to Catherine Joie, so who is from SNCB, Internship Coordinator, um, to show us what, yeah, what the rail sector is doing in answer to some of the challenges that we've heard from Heather. So thank you, Catherine. So hello, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Catherine Joie. I'm the Internships Coordinator for SNCB, the Belgian Railways Company for Passenger uh, Transport. I'm going to explain to you um, how the situation is in my company when it comes to gender equality. Now, what we see is that uh, there's an increase year after year. So, uh, when in 2015 we were at 13%, now, January 22, we are at 18%. So, we see the numbers going up, but slowly. So, um, we're still under um, one-fifth of our uh, population. Now, where are these uh, women uh, in our company? Um, as you could expect, they're uh, most easily to be found in uh, departments such as marketing and sales, uh, corporate, uh, the corporate department, which has uh, legal and HR in it. Uh, which departments have the most difficulties attracting women? Um, as you'll see, there's a technics department and the Department of Transport and uh, Operations. That's the department that uh, the train drivers are in. So those two departments are really struggling to attract uh, mm -hmm. enough women. I'll talk about the technics department first. <coughs> so um, then we're talking about uh, technicians and engineers uh, performing maintenance on our uh, trains. Um, now, what is the main uh, obstacle there to attract more women? The problem there is that to start working in uh, one of these jobs, you need to have uh, a diploma, a degree from uh, one of the VET schools, vocational mm -hmm. education and training. And these schools uh, in themselves have great difficulties attracting young people in general, and they have especially even more difficulties attracting young women. And as a consequence, the uh, candidates that we have for our technical jobs are, are rarely women. So that is really a problem that um, uh, we will have to solve together with the schools, together with the Department of Education, I think, because that's a cultural problem. Um, that we cannot solve as a company on our own. Mm -hmm. We do try to, to do things such as, um, for example, each year we organize the uh, a competition for uh, vet schools. So each year we have a subject that uh, vet schools can work on and there's a competition uh, to see which schools uh, propose the best solutions. So that's a great thing to do and I think it helps. But we need more, of course. Um, on top of that, we also work closely together with uh, several youth organizations uh, to create awareness about our jobs, uh, to show to young people that there is a future for them. Uh, in Railway, we uh, sponsor several of these uh, youth organizations. We think that is also important to uh, work together uh, with them. Uh, and our apprentices are all in the technical department. So again, as a consequence, we have great difficulties uh, finding uh, female apprentices. Uh, of course, internships, we have internships all over the com uh, company in all of these departments, but apprenticeships uh, up until now are limited to the technical departments, but we will expand to other uh, departments uh, as for next year. Then the transport and operations uh, department, as I've explained, that's the, uh, the department the train drivers are in. Um, there we have the advantage that to become a train driver, uh, it doesn't matter what you've studied in uh, upper secondary uh, education. 
um, because they're trained in company. We organize the trainings for uh, trained drivers, so it doesn't really matter what background they have. And I think that is an advantage. And therefore, we think that it should be easier to get the numbers up for trained drivers compared then to getting the numbers up for uh, technicians. On the right, you can see that uh, we have uh, a percentage of 25% of uh, women in senior management. So what we see is that uh, the percentage of women in senior management is in fact higher than the percentage in our uh, general uh, population. But again, 25% is not 50%, and it should be 50%, of course. So uh, we also have work to do uh, when it comes to our senior management. Uh, SNCB has signed the uh, Women in Rail Agreement Yeda talked about. Uh, so we signed it last year in November, and now we're working on uh, a plan. What exactly uh, will we do to meet uh, the... Um, uh, requirements to um, try and improve our number of uh, women. So we're working on it now, then it'll have to be approved by our board of directors, and then we'll be able to uh, give feedback to uh, Yeda and her uh, colleagues. But what are we doing now already? Uh, we're going to take new measures uh, for the Women in Rail Agreement, but there are things that we're doing already, of course. Um, and to us, those are not necessarily separate me measures. In fact, DNI, uh, diversity and inclusion, is an integral part of uh, our job site and candidate experience. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to that uh, on our job site in all phases of uh, recruitment. And for example, in our uh, job descriptions, um, we've trained everyone who writes uh, job uh, descriptions for gender-inclusive language. Plus, we have a limit of maximum five uh, requirements in our job descriptions because studies uh, um, learn that uh, women will check each and every one of these uh, requirements and if they feel uncomfortable with one of those, then they will not apply. So we really force our managers to limit the number of requirements uh, uh, that they only the requirements that they really need and no extra requirements. So we think that is really helpful. Uh, plus, of course, we organize uh, employer brand campaigns. Um, sometimes we organize uh, specific employer brand campaigns about diversity, but in fact, in all our employer brand campaigns, we pay attention to um, diversity. Um, the uh, campaign from last year, exactly, um, actually won us a diversity award. It's the What's My Thing uh, campaign uh, that uh, shows each time uh, one of our employees. Um, here it says, What's My Thing? Is it a paintbrush or a hairbrush? And she is, of course, one of our painters. Uh, so that's a way of um, uh, making people come to our web website to find out more about uh, Silke, who is one of our painters. And uh, as we speak, we're launching our new um, diversity campaign, the uh, 2022 campaign, which is in some ways similar to uh, last year's, because we're also playing with these prejudices. Uh, um, this is the one about the technicians. Who do you think is our technician? You see four people. Uh, for those who are wondering, it's uh, Yasmina. Of course, each time it's the woman, uh, because that is what it is about. Uh, Yelka, for example, is one of my close uh, colleagues in uh, HR. But uh, we think that helps, because uh, for people to find out, they need to go to our uh, website, and there they can immediately learn about our jobs and hopefully apply, of course. We, we also have one about our train drivers. So this is the one, who do you think our train driver is? It's uh, Adamadia, uh, our train driver. Um, so uh, we think that's really nice. So these will be, will be appearing in uh, the Belgian railway stations uh, as from now and on uh, social media. Um, what else are we doing? Uh, um, we are uh, investigating if there is a pay gap uh, between men and women in our company. We're not sure, so we need to do a study to find out. 
Um, we're also modernizing our breastfeeding rooms. Uh, we want more breastfeeding rooms and nicer breastfeeding rooms, rooms, else women will not use them uh, anyhow. Uh, plus, we will be working on uh, unwanted uh, behavior, sexual harassment. Um, we've done a survey uh, recently, an HR survey, uh, asking all sorts of questions. And uh, we found out that there's still um, uh, quite a high number of uh, uh, people um, who have experienced sexual harassment uh, in the past year. So we really need to address that, and that is especially um, a problem, apparently, according to the survey, uh, for women under 35 in our company. Um, so, uh, that is something to work on, and we think it is not only a thing to work on um, amongst our uh, employees, but also amongst passengers, because, of course, uh, train stewards may um, um, experience sexual harassment from a colleague, but it can also come from a passenger. So, uh, we're going to launch uh, a campaign about that, uh, focusing both on our uh, employees and on our customers, uh, our passengers. So that was it for me. Of course, we'll have uh, more me measures to come, but as I've explained, we're still working on the plan, so uh, there's more to come uh, soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katrine, for telling us all of these initiatives that the Belgian railways are carrying out and these really interesting campaigns which are, com have come out and are coming out. And I also noted the link with what Heather was saying around making it personal. I think seeing those images and, and putting your yourself in the place and your family in the place uh, through those images and the campaigns. And also, I think the important point about um, that the rail sector can't do it alone. Uh, it's also with the vet schools and some of these issues start much earlier. And if we're to tackle uh, these issues and get more women into the into these sectors, we need to work with the wider uh, sector as well. So we turn back to the Austrian railways for our fourth speaker. So really delighted uh, to welcome Ursula um, Bazant, who is head of education and training at OBB, to hear more about um, how you have been achieving so well to get all these uh, women apprentices uh, within the set within the uh, training centre, which we saw yesterday, and your wider initiatives. Thank you, Ursula. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, just let me mention, uh, Heather, if you really want to work with us, uh, now what that is that I saw the figures, uh, our very, very low figure of female train drivers in Austria, it's really a shame, I have to say, so if you want to work uh, with us, just apply. Uh, we would be happy to have you. I'm just not sure if we let you drive a train very often because you're such a good role model that I'm afraid we would put you in every commercial we have. That's maybe something, also something we do with our, with our apprentices, actually. We uh, use our own apprentices very much as role models and um, as, uh, for, for advertising uh, our jobs. And I think it's important to show the public that there are already some women who are doing technical jobs and technical professions, that it is not just uh, something we tell them, uh, it could be something for them, but that there are already some women. Um, that's maybe one of the most important things we do. Uh, you saw this yesterday. I think that's uh, where you have been yesterday. I hope you all enjoyed it there. Uh, for me, it's really one of the, of the best training sites I've ever seen. Um, just a short, quick, uh, quick go through what I'm doing, where I am, where my apartment stands. My apartment is not only training the apprentices, you see this on the very right. The young people, the 15 to 19 years old, my apartment is also training the, the operational personnel, uh, the vehicle technique training and technical training, uh, which is a bit new for our apartment. Um, I make this difference because the apprentices, these are really the young group. This is where we train them in professions and technical, mainly technical professions and the operational training and the vehicle uh, technique training, that's a bit separate from it. So that's not the, the very, very young people because in Austria you have to have a profession already before you start with operational training before you start uh, in training for a driver, for a shanta and so on and so forth. You have to uh, finish your apprenticeship or your school before it. Um, 
that's a short overview uh, over a lot of facts you, I guess, already heard yesterday. We have about 2,000 apprentices at the UBB group and uh, already about 20% females at the moment. I have to say that uh, if we only look at the technical professions, we have about 16%, 16%, 17% like females at the moment. That's a bit less, but still very much, because if you compare it to other, um, other industries, um, that are relevant uh, for us, it's more like four or five percent apprentices. So we already did a lot of work um, in this area and we also are a bit proud of it. Um, I will come to the measures um, right afterwards. Um, usually in normal years about 75 percent stay with us at the company. After their apprenticeship last year it was already 85 percent. Uh, we had a bit of uh, a higher number, yes, uh, in, in the last year. Um, we think that's important because we train the people for three years, for four years, we invest in them. Um, uh, we think it's important to invest in the people. Uh, we do it uh, with much enthusiasm, uh, but then we want something back from them. <laughs> we want them to work for us. And uh, that's also, I think it's good for the young people and it's good for us because we already get to know them for four years. We can train them specifically for what the UBB needs. We can give them a basis, a basis training in electronics, <coughs> let's say. Uh, but we also can give them some competences in what they really need at the UBB. And the young people profit from it because they can uh, also um, have insights of what the UBB wants, what the UBB needs, and who we are as a company. And when they finish their apprenticeships, they also can say, I don't want to work there anymore because I'm not ready for the, for the train system. I want to go to Siemens or anybody else uh, in the industry. And that's fine because we gave them a profound and solid base. Um, we have about 7, 27 apprenticeship professions, so we really have a wide, wide range. Um, that's a plus for us because all people, all young people coming to us um, who are not so sure which is the right profession for them, we can offer them a wide range and say, let's try this or let's try this. Um, we also do a lot of, uh, often a lot of internships, stages, very short internships where they can try out the different uh, occupations. And it's maybe also uh, something that is especially good for the girls because we, we think that young women, girls, often do not have so much insight in what the professions, the technical professions are really about. Young men, boys are a bit better prepared to it and have a bit more insight what the professions are about. So it's especially for the young girls, it's important to come to our training sites, to have a look what we do, to talk with our girls, with our young women who are already there about it, uh, about what the job is. That's something uh, we think it's a, it's a big favor for us. Um, the next slide. That's maybe something I only uh, switch through uh, shortly, uh, why we do it, uh, why we think diversity is important. Uh, diversity is important on one point because we think we believe in it as a core value of our company, but we are also a company, so uh, we also have to set measures that's, uh, that pay off. We cannot uh, just invest in something that doesn't pay off um, on the, in the economic terms. Um, and why does it pay off? Because first of all, uh, sometimes there are legal requirements we have to fulfill. Sometimes we want to expect, uh, expand our market because we have, want to have new or more customers. And the third point is because we want to set employer branding uh, measurements. What we do, that's just a personal, a personal clustering. Um, I see that I'm running a bit out of time. Sorry, I, I invested too much time with Heather, with recruiting Heather, I'm sorry. Um, that's just my personal, uh, personal view, how to cluster all the measures we do. Uh, that's not a scientific insight. I think it's uh, important to have kind of institutions, so to have somebody responsible for diversity and for, uh, for employing women. Uh, for sure, it's our all responsibility, but it's important to have one person, one group uh, who says, it's my effort, I have to look at our numbers, our girl numbers, our numbers of, of young women are rising. Um, it's, it's important that somebody's stepping up for it. First point. The second point is it's important to have information for the people already working here and also for the outside world uh, to see why is it good, uh, why, why, can, why can a girl work at our training site, why do we want it, um, to have also some information for the girls that are, for, for the young women that are already working with us, what, what can I do if I feel discriminated? What should I do if uh, somebody is uh, making racist and sexist jokes all the time? Is this somebody I can, I can address? So it's important to have these information ready uh, for, for women working with us. Then the third point is to set clear goals. 
our goal is to have uh, at least 20% apprentices, uh, female apprentices, until 2026. We will reach this goal this uh, autumn, uh, obviously, so we are a bit, uh, bit more faster. Um, and we also want uh, female trainers. Um, we have a lot of girls in the apprenticeships, but we don't have so many female trainers right now. That's an important goal for us. And the fourth point is projects and special topics. So to invest also in things like representation, recruiting, info campaigns, to participate in girl days, and so on and so forth. Maybe I'll stop here because the five minutes are done. That's just an overview. I can, maybe I can let uh, the slide um, be, stay there so you can read through it a bit. Uh, and maybe in the discussion we can talk about what works, what doesn't right. work, where yeah. we have to invest more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Ursula, also for being uh, so concise um, when there was a lot of information to present there and great to see all the initiatives um, that OBB is, is, um, is implementing. Um, and I think, yeah, that your last message about the trainers, uh, the female trainers, was a really important point, another one to, to note um, within that. Now, I'm afraid we do only have five minutes um, for our questions, um, but I feel sure that there will be um, some questions after some of the reactions we, we had. So please do, um, and we'll take a couple of, of questions now, so don't be shy uh, and do ask the question, the burning questions that you have. Was it, yes, I see one over here. Um, hi, Anne, European Apprentice Network. I have a question. You were all talking about diversity, but also talking about only men and female, which is not like really diverse. And also your statistics are, are, um, only said women and men, um, but you also talked about gender sensitive language. So why is that? And what are the others doing for gender sensitive language? I mean, you're missing some people there. And you identify them by assuming they are female or male, but actually you probably don't know. Okay, so um, I don't know if you would like to, to answer that question. I'm looking at the, the railway I didn't sector. Really get the question. So I think the question was around um, that we've been focusing on gender, yeah. um, but what about the other forms of diversity? And I, I think it, it was mentioned uh, transversely slightly, but because we're focusing on gender in this workshop. So perhaps briefly, if there, yeah, if there yeah, are initiatives course, also uh, in the wider diversity. diversity. Is, is, yeah, of course, diversity is not yeah. only men and women. Uh, that was the subject of today, which yes. is why, why we talked only about that. Um, but so we, we have uh, one person within our company who has the responsibility for diversity. She's the diversity coordinator. And she also works on um, people with uh, disabilities, for example, um, age differences, young people, uh, older people. Um, so there's all of that. Uh, so uh, exactly, we look at uh, diversity a lot broader than only the difference between uh, men and women. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, I'm going to just comment on that. The question was not about diversity in general, it was about gender diversity. Yeah. Because uh, gender diversity, diversity and gender inclusivity is not about men versus women. It is men, women and all who fall inside these terms and outside of that. So, uh, for example, when you talked about goals, you said 50-50, but it will never be 50-50 because that's not realistic. So that was the question. So how are we going to use and include queer people in the conversation and in the industry? Okay, thank you for the clarification. <laughs> um, so indeed, it was gender, um, the, all the di in gender and all its diversity, and not uh, so much the, the dichotomy between male and, and female. Um, so I'm sure that's something that is being taken into account. Would you like to respond to that, Yeda? Yes, thank you very much for that question, or rather comment. I think it's very much justified. You have a very strong point there, um, which I very much agree with. Um, I can comment on some of the statistics that you mentioned that indeed speak only about men and women. The reason for that at the moment is that for statistics we rely a lot on national governments, on the European Commission and on national companies to provide these kinds of statistics and these are the, the types of statistics that they, that they provide. As a trade union we would like to have this in a more inclusive way but unfortunately for the moment this is how it is. Um, I think for the future, yes, we need to broaden our horizon and not speak about only men and women, especially when we talk about inclusivity. Um, but for the moment, unfortunately, this is the reality. But uh, very fair point, and I think it's good that you bring it up today in this panel. Yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for the question. We have unfortunately come to the end of our time for this panel, even though I know we could have discussed uh, much longer. But as we said, we do have a workshop this afternoon, which we're focusing on this topic. So I really hope lots of you can join us there. And then we will be able to um, discuss in a bit more detail and all of you can feed in your ideas um, around this. So um, for the moment, uh, I'd just like to thank again our four panelists uh, for their uh, presentations and really uh, yeah, interesting insights uh, into uh, this issue and so thank you very much and we'll make uh, way for the next panel so thank you <laughs>
Um, second speaker, second panelist is uh, Ignacio Ferrer from Shabek, a vocational training center. Uh, Ignacio will tell us something about the, the project that he's currently doing in, uh, in his company, um, and uh, uh, especially from uh, um, the, the work that they are doing in their vocational training center. And third, last but not least, speaker. Uh, yes, indeed, we are back from uh, what we call a normal situation. Uh, Olivia Janisch, who is a member of the Works Council and Supervisory Board of OBB Holding, and uh, also uh, Vice Chair of Austrian Transport Workers, VIDA, which I think was also displayed in, uh, in one of the previous uh, slides. Uh, and uh, I read that Olivia would have probably fit very well also in the previous panel because you have an active role in the uh, women's network of ETF and ITF, European Transport Federation and International Transport Federation. The topic that we have uh, today uh, is quite, quite broad, but also quite, uh, quite important. Um, the idea is to discuss challenges and uh, best practices and opportunities that we, that we can face. Uh, just to throw some elements on the table, uh, the importance of transnational cooperation uh, can be translated in a win-win-win situation in the sense that it's positive, of course, for the apprentice because uh, the, the, the apprentice can go abroad and learn new, new skills, uh, not to mention, of course, all the, the language skills that can be, can be learned abroad, uh, and also new uh, operations in, in, the, in the hosting company. It's useful for the hosting company because uh, they can also see how uh, other, let's say, the culture brought by the, the, the apprentice. And of course, it's also useful for the company which sends apprentices uh, abroad because it can uh, then have something in return when the, the person is coming back. So in general, we see this as a positive point. Now the point is how to make it work in practice and how to make it uh, a structured. Uh, way of, uh, of working between uh, between uh, the between companies, and in an ideal world, also build a network. Uh, I will not speak any longer, but I will leave it up to the, our panelists to address these points, starting from Eckhart. Yeah, thank you, Leonardo, and thanks a lot for um, inviting me to this panel. Um, Leonardo, you have already introduced me. I have actually. Um, uh, that there should be one panelist more um, because I'm not representing Staffa, uh, the consortium, but I'm just one, one of the partners. Um, and uh, Staffa is coordinated um, by, by the University of Genoa and, and unfortunately nobody uh, from there could be here today uh, also because of a parallel uh, larger congress, the World Congress on Railway Research. So I, I'm actually covering perhaps two topics, introducing very shortly the Staffer Consortium and then presenting something on mobility uh, in the cross-border context in railways. Um, and that's hopefully providing some food for uh, the uh, afternoon workshop discussions. I hope, really hope so. Uh, so uh, to provide you uh, with a, a brief overview of, of the Staffer Blueprint project, um, it's, uh, I think, at the moment, uh, are, uh, quite a comprehensive consortium of uh, 32, um, I think today 31 partners. And um, I think it's uh, quite uh, comprehensively covering both the rail operators, infrastructure managers, as well as the rail supplier uh, industry. And, um, what is, uh, I would say, also in comparison to other Erasmus uh, Blueprint projects, a bit unexceptional, is that, that of course, the European uh, level uh, um, employer organizations are directly involved as partners. The trade union are involved um, uh, via the advisory board of, of the um, Staffer Consortium but also uh, quite a large number of companies are uh, directly involved. Um, some of those here in the room, uh, thinking of um, SNCF, ÖBB, um, but also uh, Deutsche Bahn are um, active partners and co-leaders of some uh, of the work packages. And, and then we have rail the rail supplier industry with um, larger companies also representatives represented in the consortium. Um, 
apart from a dozen of educational institutions covering vocational uh, schools, colleges, um, Uh, universities of applied science um, and, and, and other universities um, focusing on, on the rail sector and the whole um, and diverse partnership is complemented by a number of associated partners um, covering in total 13 countries and coordinated and this uh, really is a challenge with this diverse partnership by the University of, of Genoa. Um, as regards our activities, um, I think um, together with other blueprints, other sectoral blueprints, we started um, in October last year um, with a four-year du duration of the project and this dotted line um, illustrates a bit where we are right now. Uh, so we have a number of work packages. We have completed um, some work packages and I will show you some of the results of The second work package would, with, uh, which deals with um, uh, cross-border cooperation and exchange, but the whole phase one that now has been completed was about the identification of skills needs of future skill requirements both in rail operation, infrastructure and um, the supplier industry. Um, We have now started a second phase that are, uh, is about the development of uh, concrete programs. Um, I will focus in my um, remaining slides on concrete programs in the field of cross-border mobility because this is a specific need um, that was highlighted already in previous presentations. Um, and also a big challenge in the railway sector, I have to say. And then we have a third phase uh, starting at the end of this year, beginning of next year, where it's going to develop a long-term action plan for the whole sector and um, uh, then uh, some um, accompanying work packages. This is the, um, the work plan. Uh, what I would like to present you are results from quite a comprehensive survey we did Uh, in the last year, during the summer, um, covering rail operators, uh, infrastructure managers and, um, and research institutions um, with um, a response rate of um, more than 80, covering, I think, 19 or 20 countries. And it presents an, a good overview of what is um, um, going on in terms of activities also in the cross-border and mobility context. We have addressed a lot of other issues in the survey, but I would like to present you just some uh, results regarding cross-border and mobility because this is the topic of the session. And um, I think from previous presentations we have learned that uh, the there is a strong trend and also need uh, to have uh, increased cross-border activities within railways, both in the freight and passenger transport. Um, and um, it was also mentioned, I think, by one um, colleague this morning that railways, there is the opportunity to, uh, to work in an international context. Uh, but that's uh, also a challenge because the railway sector still is uh, very much characterized by national systems, national systems of security um, and control. And this is a huge challenge um, also um, related to uh, different necessary contents of training apart from different training systems um, all over uh, Europe. Um, And therefore, in the survey, the, the lack of uh, cross-border knowledges and, and uh, skills was highlighted by many, many participants. Um, this is already the last slide, Leonardo, so um, I won't be too long. Um, so the survey participants um, stress the need to do more in, in terms of cross-border mobility, training and exchange. And uh, in the first, in the in, in this work package uh, that we have led together with other uh, railway companies, uh, we looked also at um, Erasmus exchange programs, uh, cooperation programs uh, in the field of technical education in the railway sector. And one important and I would say concerning result is that. Uh, 
Um, as compared also to other transport sectors um, and as compared to uh, the uh, manufacturing industry, we found quite few projects um, and we also found hardly any projects uh, in the Erasmus uh, database that uh, have been um, characterized by an active role of companies. So what we um, um, gathered are good practices of long term. There is a very strong cooperation between two or more companies in the field of exchange of apprentices, for example, between SNCF and, and Deutsche Bahn. There are also other uh, projects and activities but uh, when you look at what is going on in the whole sector, there still uh, is a gap uh, between the needs in the future and what is happening right now. And I think uh, this afternoon we might look at uh, what, what uh, consequences are arising from that. We think that one point uh, should be that there uh, should be some kind of um, uh, sector-related scheme for this kind of exchange. Uh, that supports companies to be uh, to make more active use of funds like uh, Erasmus um, or others. Uh, there are some uh, nice examples in other sectors, but I think there is a strong need for that in the future if we really w would like to be serious in terms of uh, cross-border railway development and development also of European mindsets. So. Sorry for taking a bit longer. Thank you, Eckhard. I think it was, uh, it was good to have your uh, conclusion. <laughs> and a well-deserved applause. Um, I think uh, just one point I, I want to, uh, from, to retain from your presentation. You focused a lot on cross-border, which is probably uh, the, the most obvious uh, section on which uh, transnational cooperation is needed. But we should not forget that most of the rail transport in general is, uh, is not cross-border, is, uh, is run at national level. But there still there is a usefulness in, uh, in fostering uh, uh, transnational cooperation. Uh, so the, the two things should be addressed together. Uh, and also thanks for uh, already putting some elements for the afternoon discussion that we will have more in depth later on after lunch. I will now move to Ignacio for the uh, follow-up. I think your presentation follows quite uh, uh, nicely in the, in the order uh, in, uh, on the, the activities of the Shabek Vocational Training in Valencia. And sorry for my bad pronunciation. The floor <laughs> is yours. You have pronounced very well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm, I'm very pleased to participate in this session of mobility and transnational cooperation because it's not common that a vocational training center participate or can say what they think about the, the real life of the vocational center and to share this experience with people who is, come from companies, people from the uh, European Commission that they have um, they can change the policies and they can influence the policies. This is a very good opportunity for, for us. As a director of training center, I have to confess that this night was very difficult to sleep because in my mind was the buildings of the OBV, the full motivated students from OBV, so this is the ideal <laughs> vocational training center, and, and I, have, I want to congratulate to, to the center, and, and thank you very much for, for uh, sharing your good experiences, and, and I hope that we can trans, uh, transfer some of your <laughs> ideal model to, to our uh, training center. Okay, time is running, <laughs> time flies. And I prepared this uh, slide. I, I want only to, <coughs> to, pro to propose three topics. Uh, and later, if you want, we can speak in more detail of one of them. The first one is uh, Erasmus Plus Mobility in the metal sector and railway sector. It's uh, called Technics on the Move. And the second is, I want to speak about the <coughs> transnational cooperation. I, we work with different networks, and I want, to, I want to introduce you. And finally, the positive impact of the mobilities and transnational cooperation in, at the school. Okay. 
So <coughs> I have selected uh, five uh, mobilities uh, of this project. The first one was a, a student of the rail sector that went to Koblenz. We have an agreement with the Chamber of Commerce of Koblenz. It is very interesting agreement because one of the problems in Spain is that we have a very high uh, youth unemployment rate. So by this agreement, we send students with apprentices with three months, and later they can uh, get a job in, in Germany. So it has been very interesting, especially during the crisis, economical crisis at the end of 2012, 2013. This is very, very, very nice. The second and the third uh, mobility are very similar, are very short mobility, only two weeks. Uh, our students went to Arus, to Denmark, and they spent uh, two weeks, and the 30, uh, sorry, 70% of time they spend in the Danish uh, railway national um, company. And in the case of Munich, uh, they uh, spend the same period of time in the city council uh, company in charge of the metro uh, maintenance. So this is very interesting. It's a very short experience, but it's very uh, interesting for, for students. They come back with new skills, social skills, and, and of course, they, it's essential for their professional development. And the fourth, I think this perhaps for me is the most interesting, uh, interesting one. Uh, as a di director of the Chabec, I'm very worried about the professional development of the teachers. Okay? They are the key for the qualification of the students. They are the key for the mobility, for the innovation uh, pedagogical projects, so they are the key. So we have to care. And in this case, we work together with CAF. CAF is a Spanish company. Uh, they have factories of locomotives and trams in, in Zaragoza and in the Basque Country. And we sent two teachers <coughs> for two weeks, and they went to a workshop in Debrecen, Hungary. And they stay during two weeks. This is very nice because after this uh, mobility, we start different programs because we have a strength the relationship between company and uh, and training center. We are able to do now uh, tailor-made courses and so on. And the last one is uh, a mobility in Portugal, Lisbon. We have now, just now, and <laughs> they are finishing at the end of June, two students for two students for three months. Uh, in the company Este Confer, that is a company in charge of the maintenance of the rail uh, infrastructure. So how we organize the mobilities? We work in two kinds of networks. The first one is, of course, a network of bed colleges, because all the mobilities we have organized for, with, uh, with uh, colleges that has agreements with different companies, so this is the way to to organize the apprentices period. We work in two vet colleges networks, IMEI and IMEU. Uh, more or less 23 colleges of industry and transport they, uh, are members of that, um, these networks. And the teachers is, uh, meet annually between them, organizing the international departments. We have a department of electricity, another one of mechanical, and of course, in the railway sector, okay? So they annually make a meeting and we speak about innovation, qualification skills, uh, and of course, mobility of, of students. And the other network is like an unexpected network, is the international companies. We start to work uh, with Stadler that they have, uh, it's a company that has a, an important factory next to Chabec very close to Chabec in Valencia. And we have, of course, local uh, apprentices program with them. But they are, the rail sector is a global sector. Okay? They build locomotives, trams, and they sell the, the locomotives ar around the world, abroad. So they need international talent. They need students that we will be able to, to go abroad to, for the new workshops they are opening around the world. So, this is like a, 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 a different network. And I would like to emphasize in the confidence. 
network of vet colleges and the local apprenticeship program uh, make confidence with, with Chabec, with training centers and, and companies. And finally, only five seconds, sorry. <laughs> I would like to, to emphasize, okay, sorry, to emphasize to, uh, the positive impact. We have developed for the international apprentices and international courses, we have developed the e-learning training. We have transformed the project methodology, a face-to-face -face methodology based, learning based project in virtual reality. I'm sorry, but the, the, the Illustrate uh, is not in the presentation for technical problems. And we have implemented new learning e-learning courses in the abroad. The first one was in Seget. Uh, Staller has a, a group of employees in, in this city for the tram maintenance. And finally, we recently started a new e-learning course for people of Montevideo, Uruguay, uh, with a local company that has uh, bought some locomotives from Staller. So, Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have questions or your, some discussion points, okay, of course, I will be very pleased to answer you later. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ignacio, for your presentation. Uh, I, I, I retain three points from, from your, your presentation. One is that actually transnational cooperation is happening, and this is the, the first one. Another one that I think it's quite interesting is that you are using the, the Spanish network, for example, CAF abroad, to, uh, uh, let's say, go abroad exactly. yourself. And this is also, let's say, a clever way to, to, to move in this respect. And from your last slide, you are bringing the transnational cooperation to the next level with e-learning outside Europe. Exactly. So that's also something we can, uh, we can take in mind. Uh, I will now move to uh, Olivia for your presentation. Uh, I think over the last uh, days we have learned a lot about OBB. Everyone was uh, enthusiastic about the, um, the, the, the visit we had yesterday at the, the training center. By the way, I feel a bit sorry for those who are following online because they are probably regretting by now not having come to, to Vienna after all the enthusiastic feedback we had on the, uh, on the training center. Um, but maybe you will complete this picture now also with the perspective from the um, Austrian Transport Workers Union. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm the one without the presentation. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here um, in my role as a social partner. It's, um, as you know and as you can read, I'm in the Works Council. I strongly and often work together with Stefan, who organized this event so very well, um, also in regular discussions with Ursula, but also with other members of the management in the ÖBB. And, um, well, in this respect, I really want um, to say that um, the social partnership in the company is a really good one. And this is really necessary to say, because without working together, without taking into account um, some critical points that may appear. We cannot make all these innovations we put in brochures or in headlines. We have to do it together. So um, this I really want to, to stress at the beginning because it's important. And we saw it in the plenary before. If you take the social partnership on the European level, if we would not have this Women in Rail agreement, which is a binding agreement, which is not uh, normal in a social dialogue, there would be no evolution, I would say, because now we are monitoring what we are doing there. And there's also the social partnership uh, on a national level, which in Austria is actually the trade union or the labor chambers, where we also go forward and um, looking to the sectors, um, where we can make improvements and where we have our negotiations when it comes to collective bargaining. And um, also in this respect, I want to say um, last year we had uh, our collective bargaining agreement with uh, a focus uh, on the apprentices. And we highlighted all um, the challenges like digitalization, automation, green jobs, whatsoever. They are correct, but there are more than these challenges. We are in times now, and 
also before, of inflation. People need money to live. And especially apprentices need money to live. So the incomes have to be raised also when you are, are an apprentice and not only when you're an employee. So this is also one real basis of, of good working together and be attractive for apprentices also have a fair and a just income. And we did this last year in our collective bargaining agreement and we had um, a rise up to 25% in some um, technical apprentice uh, programs, which was necessary, but we also closed some legal gaps. Like the time we, we, we heard it, and, and maybe I, when I came here, I, I got this brochure in my hands and I said, good for youth, good for business. Hmm, maybe good jobs and good incomes help to get the best apprentices and to get them to stay in the company. <laughs> because I, have, I can do all the apprenticeship programs and they are good and they are necessary, but we have to get the chance for them from the apprenticeship to being an employee. And when you finished your um, uh, apprenticeship um, in Austria, it's like that afterwards if you want to become a train driver. You have uh, another program. And then you have your job. <laughs> and that's uh, the important thing then, that the whole career line must be a good one, must be a safe one. And um, so maybe this would be, if we, we think it in a, in a wider, in a broader sense, uh, which I want to also um, stress here. And yes, as a trade union, we started also with um, program, programs um, with our sister trade union, I would say, in, in, um, in Germany. And we do it uh, on a regular basis that our um, youth representatives, and I'm very, very happy that some of them are here, because they are interested in politics, they are interested in the working conditions. They also come here. It would be really nice to have seen more apprentices on the panels, maybe, to hear their voices. Um, and they also tell me, um, and, th and this we have um, a consensus, they also tell me they want to uh, go abroad, they want to have intercultural exchange, they want to see how other apprentices learn, what are the working conditions in the Deutsche Bahn, for example. We also had, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we had an inter uh, exchange program, uh, the ÖBB, together with the SNCF, some years ago, that was very important. Uh, they also came back and said, this was, this was good, we learned a lot, we want to do it more often. Um, we do it as trade unions, we do it also, um, well, we started with the German-speaking countries. I think this could be also rolled out um, when it comes uh, to programs between companies. Um, I'm just saying like the Dach region or the German-speaking country first, or those countries who have similar um, programs apprentice programs where you have uh, similar um, needs as well and, and also when it comes to safety levels yeah because I'm a little bit alerted sometimes when I see the harmonization or how did um, the speaker at the beginning put it um, there are good jobs ahead and the future is great for the railway sector not automatically <laughs> we, we have to work on that. And uh, then we have to really face the day-to-day -day, um, challenges, like the legal framework. If um, apprentices go abroad, um, how there is the social insurance? Yeah? Um, if we talk about harmonization, I don't want to downsize or down-level safety standards. And to be honest, it very often happens in Europe, when we talk about the European Union and the European Commission, that we have downsizing and downleveling safety standards. And this must not happen when it comes to the apprentices. It must be a top level, it must be a top safety level, quality standards, also when it comes to educational, uh, vocational training. Um, and also afterwards, um, I hope we do not talk about mobility or transnational mobility having in mind that we shift the workforce around Europe and do dumping, like social dumping or dumping of wages, because 
as a trade unionist, allow me to be a critical voice here. We have seen it very often. And at the moment, we already have these problems. And one last word, because I'm also over time now. Um, it's so perfect to be here and to discuss uh, future ways of working together, um, how making the whole system and uh, apprentice uh, programs better. It will not help at all if the European, European Commission, on the other hand, is really, yes, risking jobs in the railway section and in the railway sector. I'm talking now about the public service obligation, um, and we see a lot of bad examples, like in Germany with Abellio, what happens when a dogma of free market liberalization to what it leads. It does not help the company. There are like millions um, of miners there <laughs> where politics has to jump in and uh, throw money in. There is no better quality. Um, there's no more safety. Uh, there's no more, we always talk about passenger rights and their needs, it's not better for them. And the jobs, they are less, not more. The workers afterwards have to look where can they work and where is their place on the labor market. So this is my last critical remark. But um, I think if we all have this in mind, um, we pave a way for a really bright uh, future of the railway sector. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia, especially for bringing on the table very concrete points that we, that we need to address, in which also the, the, the Commission has a role to play. Uh, I would uh, mention what you said about uh, uh, job condition and job security, which was one of the main uh, points I retained from the, the visit yesterday. We had our guide who admitted that uh, the conditions at ÖBB were a decisive factor for him to, um, to, 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 to join the company as an apprentice and also to imagine uh, a career in the company in the future. Uh, so at the end of the day, we may have very uh, high-level strategies, but what really counts is to have a, also a salary at the end of the month. Uh, the, the point on insurance with relation to, um, to uh, transnational mobility, I understand this is also uh, a concrete issue that is being faced. And again, you can have the best possible strategy, but if you are confronted with the administrative issues, uh, then you, you are in trouble in any case. Um, and when it comes to the, uh, the, the need to ensure social, uh, good social conditions to workers, I think this is in line with what the Commission is doing. Of course, we are struggling to, to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, of course, we consider this a, a priority in any case. Uh, I will now open the floor for questions. We have uh, around six minutes. There is, uh, there is, I already can see two. <coughs> yeah. There is, a, yeah, the lady first. I'm, I'm Barbara Grau from SNCF. We are an active member in Staffer. So I work together with uh, Eckhart Foss very much. SNCF is very much interested in the mobility of apprentices, and we heard it already, we had already exchanges with ÖBB, with DB. DB. Now, as Eckhart said, in Staffa, we want to bring this on a higher, more general level and find a framework, a scheme, how we can organize uh, these exchanges uh, between the companies. And my question would go to Ignacio, because I have the impression you have already done something like this in this direction of finding a scheme or a framework. What kind, what would you th say are the most important points that we have to work on when we start our work package on the mobility of apprentices? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't have the correct answer. <laughs> I can share with you the, my, our experience, okay? So, really, in our case, we start to provide of, uh, railway qualifications because there is a need of employment in, in this factory in, in, in Staller. 
Um, so the employment is the motivation, the main motivation to start to work about, uh, about this kind of qualification. So we have always uh, had the, the help of companies to design curricula, to design uh, the, also the, the apprenticeships calendars, okay, that are very different in Spain than in, 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 the, in, in Deutschland or in, in, in Austria. So we are always work together with a company. And the, the company is who has a boss to, to us to, to, to go abroad, okay? This is one way. Once we have an official qualification, uh, we have been working with Inmain. Inmain is an educative association that uh, we are the leaders. Uh, Chabek is the leader of this association. And we work focus on the, t on the teachers. I think that the teachers are the main person that can give you the information to, for, the, for the main skills that the apprentices need and the employees of the company's needs. Okay, so I think you have to boost the relationship between teachers and instructors of companies because it's the way to get the, the information. Thank you. Next question, the gentleman, please. Uh, this is another question for Ignacio. Okay. Uh, I would like that you could say something on your, from your experience on the key issues uh, for apprentices in long-term mobility. And another question, if you can elaborate something on uh, the importance of family and the importance of the parents in the long-term mobility as well. Thank you. Okay, so I think that this is a, a very good question because we have uh, speak about, in general, young people, okay? But usually uh, the mobility we, uh, we organize with people between 16, 17 years old. It's very often because the lowest qualification is in this range of age. In this moment, this is uh, very important, the, fa the, the family. You have to consider the, the, you have to hear the family, the mom and the father, uh, what your opinion, and to organize with them the hosting activities and so on. I think that in this case, the most important is the, the confidence between the sending institution and the hosting institution. In Portugal, we have a very good partner, this Valdo Rio, and every year they send us two students, and we send two students to them. And the teachers are very confident. I'm, I'm sure that my students will be to feel comfortable in, in, in Portugal, or also in Germany, in, in, in Munich, because we have a very good relationship, personal relationship and confidence. So I think this is very important. If you speak with the father, okay, don't worry. <laughs> I know very well to the teacher who is hosting. This is, I think, a very good, uh, an important question for the success of the, of the mobility. There are three two more small, questions. Two yeah. small remarks and one question for Mrs. Janish. <laughs> Liberalized market is not a jungle. So European Railway Agency is there to safeguard a very high level of safety with new entrants and with incumbents. Um, don't forget that uh, the railways declined until the liberalization and the decline stopped after the liberalization. We had 15% market share in, uh, at the beginning of the year uh, 2000s, and we have now 17%. So my question is, don't you think that um, uh, some apprentices are more interested in challenges, entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship, than uh, in uh, having a secure job? <laughs> <laughs> really? It's a question. Wow. It's a real question. Okay. Uh, let me tell you the following. We, we talk with our apprentices and um, not only talking. Uh, we ask them what they want and what they need. We um, 
do a reg we do it regularly. We ask them with um, um, the, the last was la this year in May, I think, um, where they can give a feedback what they want, how they think um, their apprenticeship uh, is going good, what is good, what is not so good. So I'm not talking about them. I'm telling you also what they told us because we ask them what they want. And yes, they are interested to go abroad. Yes, they are open-minded. Yes, they want to be innovative. Yes, they want to do everything like that, but they want to be treated with respect. That's also one, one big point their, um, uh, their feedback is. Um, treat us with respect. Treat us not only like the, the, the groundlings, <laughs> um, which somehow have to um, rise until they are uh, like human beings or on the same level. Uh, that's what they say, respectful working conditions. Um, and they all say, okay, and afterwards, what is afterwards? We, we, we want... Um, yeah, we, we want to stay in the company, but we, have, we want to have the same benefits like uh, the older colleagues. Um, if we want to uh, have families, we, how, do, how should we do it without money? Um, we ha want to have our contracts which are safe. Okay, some of them say, I'm, I'm more, mo mobility is okay, and after two, three or four years, I, I, I change my job. But it's not only because they want it, because no, very often they are forced to, <laughs> because the working conditions are not that good. I'm not talking now about the Austrian Federal Railways, um, but all, what we hear from other railways as well. Um, it's, it's not like how it was on, on the, the public relations paper. <laughs> because in real life it's different. And then they change at the job, not only because they are so happy uh, to be a butterfly flying around Europe uh, and going to, to, to every country or to, to another company, also because sometimes they hope they have got better working conditions there. So, so the need for, for also security in the sense of social security um, is there. That's what they tell us. Um, it's not only my personal view. It's what I'm um, giving to you as uh, what we heard when we ask the apprentices. Please, we take two more questions. Please. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ferrer, I wanted to come back to the subject of exchange uh, of uh, apprentice, apprentices uh, between uh, companies in Europe, maybe, or in the world. But... Um, in fact, there is a subject of uh, su financial support because, uh, okay, uh, apprentices uh, earn a little money, but uh, level of life is uh, mm. very different between countries and towns. So I think it's a great problem. So USC would dream and uh, would hope to, to be maybe a platform to, to support companies to exchange their apprentices, but I think we have to think to support financial supports. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in Spain, it's very difficult <laughs> to get financial support to do apprenticeships in Spain. Okay. This is one of the problems uh, we have. In fact, uh, in January, the, government, the Spanish government has approved a new uh, vocational training regulation. And now, this year, 2022, now it's compulsory <laughs> to pay to, for apprenticeships. Okay, of course, in my opinion, uh, and Chabec works in the metal sector, so it's a good sector, and, and the rail sector, so it's a good sector because there is money to, to pay uh, grants to, to for, this, for the apprenticeships but it's not the common situation in, in, in Spain. So we are very aware of this problem. But in the case of the low level of vocational training Erasmus program, the grant is enough to, for the students now, for two weeks uh, at least. Yes, for the short, for the short uh, mobility are enough. Uh, usually it is not a problem to decide to go abroad. <clears throat> but in the case of the long-term uh, mobilities of three months, uh, of course, it's a problem, and the family, usually, or students, has to, um, to, 
to pay some, some of the costs of the mobility. But usually the hosting, act, uh, hosting, um, the hosting <coughs> vocational training centers, usually they help to ask or to look for cheapest solutions for hosting and, and so on. So we have a very good uh, help for, for, of, from the hosting um, training centers. But this is a problem. <laughs> um, we want to solve with, with confidence again. <laughs> Thank you, Ignacio. I think we have one last question from Anna. Yes, well, it's two questions, but <laughs> first one for Eckhart. Uh, um, I understand that even if you are not the representative of Stafford, you still know a bit about the project. So. Um, because I wanted to put it in relation to what uh, uh, Carol said this morning uh, about uh, public authorities uh, taking on board uh, the skills needs in, in the design of their program. So I would like to know, even if the project is still ongoing, how are you doing this? If, the, if national authorities are being informed about a staffer project and whether they are taking on board your findings? And then for, for Ignacio, um, I would like to know uh, how you have developed the long-term partnerships with your hosts in other countries. Was it through teachers' exchanges in the past or through other means? And if you could tell the audience, because I think they are interested, how you have solved the problem of social uh, insurance, the social security, uh, when sending people abroad, mm -hmm. And why is it different from sending teachers abroad? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I start. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, as regards um, what we develop in the Staffel project so far, the national authorities haven't been involved. And um, it's a European project. And the aim really is to develop activities um, uh, both in, at the national level, with few on developing um, more, um, uh, uh, I would say, linkages uh, cross-border to other companies, this kind of exchange, and mobility of stuff, including apprentices. And what was said before about the, the challenges in that context, it's really um, our feeling that there uh, should be more in terms of uh, what, what also what Barbara said, uh, sectoral framework conditions, perhaps partnerships between companies in order to uh, open this up because it's really ÖBB, DB, SNCF, it's a very few number of companies that, that have uh, on, on the basis of own initiatives, I think uh, not necessarily uh, funded by uh, Erasmus, but um, its own partnerships and I think this needs to be broadened and um, more uh, companies and actors have to be involved. So our uh, authorities involved in that, in the stuff, uh, in this mobility trend, I would say, uh, are um, rather uh, kind of European actors, the European organizations, CR, UNIFE and also others. I think it should be open in the end also for um, other actors in the field. Um, the second question regarding skills, also I think what we found is that we looked at 30 railway specific occupations and how digitalization and automation is affecting them in terms of new tasks arising, uh, upskilling needs, uh, new skill requirements and here we are now coordinating an approach to uh, start a discussion with European actors. Um, we, we worked on the ESCO uh, database and um, so we found that uh, from the perspective of company practices, there are um, uh, certain challenges uh, regarding not only the need to, to update perhaps the skills description as it is in this really a unique database because it's so multilingual. Uh, you have it in all uh, in, uh, all languages. That is a real unique character. But the uh, description of new emerging skills or skills related to interoperability. This is a, a huge challenge when 
also this database should be used by the companies. And we learned that quite a few companies are um, even aware of this database. That was a discussion, point of discussion with the Erasmus agency. And so the next step will be to have an exchange with uh, the uh, DG employment and the ESCO responsible persons and um, also perhaps um, CDFOP. So it's rather the European institutions that we uh, intend to work with uh, from, from the perspective of Staffa. Thank you. And okay. Ignacio? So two, <laughs> both questions. The first one is about the construction of the networks. Okay. So in Maine, um, we started in a Leonardo partnership in 2011. So at the beginning of times, <laughs> 10 years ago, the, um, the Valencian regional government uh, asked to Chavek if we want to start an international um, network. And we start, we make a call. And I remember that in the first meeting, uh, people from France, Turkey, and the Netherlands came to Chavek. And then we decided to start a, a, a Leonardo partnership. And in this project, uh, two or three vocational training centers, uh, from, one from uh, England, UK, and from Germany, and they uh, joined to, to this project. And in this project, we define the goals of the, of the um, network. It's, I think there are two, two characteristics. One is the is focus in industry and transport. Okay, so there is uh, similar fields, and the second aspect is to to boost the professional development career of the teachers. Okay, so we organize international departments. We organize the annual meetings with them. And after that, the results are that uh, teachers think about new project innovation. Okay, so we have developed, for instance, now we are developing a key action two project in energy transition. We are developed. We have applied now. Well, we have developed the virtual reality module, and the teachers has have participated in this uh, project. And now we are uh, waiting for <laughs> an application that we have applied for, for doing a network of remote control workshops, okay, from uh, five different uh, uh, training centers around Europe in automation, welding, and the rail sector, of course. So I think if, you, uh, if the teachers can participate, then the things are working. And teachers inviting another centers and you are growing naturally, okay? And the second question is about the insurance, okay? So, uh, we, uh, there are two, two, two important aspects for organizing the mobilities. The first aspect is that we have a relation with the regional Valencian government of, uh, edu uh, in education. Uh, they have a program for, three, for the internships or apprenticeships uh, periods, and they, it's compulsory to, to, to get an insurance with them, okay? So this is one aspect, and the other aspect is the economical uh, budget that is financed by the Erasmus Plus program, okay? So the insurance is by the official uh, educative uh, government, administration of Valencia. <coughs> Thank you, Ignacio, and thanks to all the, the three panelists for the lively discussion. The good news is that we can continue this discussion in the afternoon in the dedicated session on transnational mobility. I think we had quite a lot of topics to, to address this afternoon. So I would like to thank again Ignacio, Olivia and Eckhart for their contribution. Uh, thank you all for uh, keeping it lively with your questions and uh, wrap it up and give, it, and give the floor back to Anna for some closing remarks on this morning's session. Thank you.
Yes, thanks a lot for the very interesting session. Indeed, we will have more time to continue discussing a lot of food for thought. So now some very practical uh, remarks. Uh, we are going for lunch now uh, to the cafeteria. We will have time until 2.15, so uh, one hour and a quarter. And right afterwards, we will join the workshops. Mm? So very important information. Uh, the workshop on digital and green will take place in the first floor, uh, in the blue train room. The workshop on gender equality also on the first floor, on the, uh, in the Orient Express room. And the workshop on mobility will take place here. Mm -hmm. So you come directly to the workshops afterwards. So uh, for our online participants, the workshops won't be streamed, so you can continue following uh, the conference later at uh, quarter to four, uh, clicking in the, on the link in the chat. So enjoy your lunch and see you later.